Okay. <clears throat> to my immediate left is Julian Grimmond. Julian's with Global Film Solutions. I want to call it a different name, GFS. Glo Julian does risk analysis. He's our risk specialist. But Julie and I also know each other from 13 years ago when he was one of the producers on The Amazing Race and also worked as one of our foreign facilitators. So Julian's got a few hats to wear today because he brings a couple of different perspectives. Um, but we're going to nail him on the risk stuff right off the, the top. Um, Kate Imp is next. Okay. Uh, I am the... Uh, production supervisor and in-house risk manager for The Amazing Race. So for the last seven years, I have been handling the foreign risk with all of our foreign facilitators for every country we go to, um, working with CBS Risk Management and their foreign insurance brokers to make sure that we are safe, whatever we do. And we do some pretty crazy stuff. So um, that's, that's how I got immersed in it. And uh, I said earlier, I, I have the blessing and the curse to actually understand insurance. And so it gives me that place to be able to explain to our producers why they have to do what they have to do and why I'm a hard ass on it. Um, we've been very lucky. You wouldn't say that to the people that were injured, but the only people pretty much who have ever been injured on race are producers. So <laughs> you want to know what we're talking about. <laughs> um, we have not, we've not had any, any with any, all the stunts and everything we've done, we've not had any problems ever. And I give that to the producers, to the crews that we use, to the, the specialists that we hire, and also because we make sure through our risk and everything that our T's are crossed and our I's are dotted and we've got everything in place so that if something happens we know what to do. So that's me and I'll move on to Kate. Kate is with, Kate Imp is with Ray, Raymo Law and she's, we look to Kate for the production side for the legal that we'll talk about today and Stephanie Ward is next and Stephanie's at Electus and Stephanie has also been on the sort of studio network side um, previously at Discovery and where else, Stephanie? No, just Discovery. Yeah, Discovery. So she's, she's sort of bringing the legal studio network production side as well as just dealing with production on that side. And Toby Kopp is from Aon, uh, Albert G. Rubin. And Toby's our insurance guru today. Um, he'll be talking a lot. <laughs> and what we're going to try and do is we've got a ton of stuff to cover what we're mainly looking at is touching on things we'll have a Q&A at the end we're going to get into looking at documents and things like that so if you've got your handouts or a way to look at them just to go through some basic things and some terminology mainly what we want you to do when you walk out of here is have some of your questions answered but also have some questions to take back to your production people and ask so that you know what you need to get or who's dealing with what or did anybody think about it and how to go about getting those things started and those things addressed. Because most of the time, I think as producers, and I know that from the experience on race, is people tend to think that somebody else has taken care of it. And you don't want to be in that position if something does happen that you're standing there not knowing who to talk to, what to ask, where to go. So hopefully this is going to give you that, some of that basis to take back to your productions. And this is also for people who are setting up their independent productions, who are starting a production company and what do I do? What do I need? Um, give you things to start thinking about that way, not just, I've got a great script and a great story, but as Julian will be able to address, somebody needs to look at that to see what your challenges are going to be and how you need to address that. So that being said, um, let's move on and talk about what is risk. So I'm going to throw that to you, Julian. 
and to Toby to kind of throw in and, and everybody chime in when they want to. Um, good morning. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, hopefully that's close enough. Um, so risk is really, at the end of the day, um, what's going to go wrong on your project um, and how to identify it so that you uh, end up with an acceptable uh, outcome. And what we do at Global Film Solutions is go through a really formal process of risk assessment. Um, and at the end of a risk assessment, it's really the beginning because it's an organic process which, you know, once you have the culture of the organisation on board, as um, Mary Pat was saying, um, you actually end up um, having everyone participating um, in that process. Um, the major view that we have is where there's risk, there's opportunity. And the idea is to get as close to that risk as you can without, um, in other words, accelerating your opportunity, but without tripping over yourself and having a negative outcome, which is where uh, lawyers and insurers come in. So that's <laughs> Let's pass it down. Let's everybody go, go ahead and throw in your two cents about risk and where you fit. So, um, as, as we kind of touched on when, when I was introduced, uh, at Ramel Law, we are dealing with a lot of very small productions. Um, we're, we're dealing with a lot of, um, independent producers who may not be attached to a network or, you know, a studio. And there can be pros and cons with that, but a definite con is that you've got a lot of people that it may be their first time in being the, the, the lead producer, or we've got smaller budgets where we can't bring on, you know, perhaps certain people that can really give us uh, the risk assessment. So it ends up being, you know, essentially me and the insurance carrier and the two basically lead producers kind of putting our heads together and figuring out from development and pre-production what we need to do to lower risk moving forward based on what where we're shooting, what type of production it is, um, you know, it, whether there's stunts and things like that. And I, I think, uh, I'm sure we're going to say this over and over again, but the, the best piece of advice I can give with respect to risk is that you just have to tell me what's going on. And, and I think that that, that is the, the hardest thing for us attorneys is I can't um, give you a risk assessment if I, if I don't know all the details. Um, so, so that's what we try and do from the beginning. As soon as we've got a new production, we have uh, a few phone calls where we're really asking questions and getting into it so we can figure out where that risk is before we're ever even getting close to production. Um, so don't be afraid. There is no dumb question. Um, on the more network studio side, usually we don't do a risk assessment until the project's actually been sold, which has its pros and cons as well because obviously if you've sold something and now you have got find out it's too risky to actually make, you, you've got a couple of problems on your hands. Um, but usually, you know, we'll engage someone like Julian who will run a risk assessment and as part of it we'll talk about is it a high risk, a medium risk, or a low risk, as well as what you can do to actually mitigate that risk. It will have suggestions in there. And then that becomes something that we will talk to our production teams about. You know, are these things we can actually put in place? Or is this just going to be so incredibly cost prohibitive that ultimately we're not going to be able to do that? Are there any other options? Um, and this ends up dovetailing, I think, to, to Toby here, because what will happen is if something is too risky, I can't get insurance to bind. And I've had that happen before on projects where, you know, we wanted to do something that was undercover or, you know, confronting a potential cheater who may have not been the most mentally stable person and they might have had a concealed carry permit. Believe it or not, insurance, not too thrilled with that idea. Um, I know, shocking. <laughs> who could have seen that coming? Um, but it's really being able to dig down into that risk assessment and put together a production plan that we can take to our insurance to say, hey, does this work? Can we make this show? And as long as we're in an acceptable risk pool, someone like Toby says yes. If we've gone too far, they tell us no. And then we have to go back to the network and say, hey, look, here's the problem, and then talk about creative solutions in terms of how can we change this creatively? Could we move where we're filming? Could we change this stunt? You know, what, what do we do to make it so it's still producible? But sometimes if it's too essential to the actual storyline, then the show just will fall apart, which is unfortunate. 
and risk for me kind of encapsulate everything that my fellow panelists have talked about. So once you're at the point of the project's greenlit, you've had discussions with legal business affairs, and you've done a risk assessment of your own, it really comes to me, and my goal at that point is to how do we transfer that risk to a uh, financially strong insurance com company or somebody that can actually back up the capital? Because when you're going out there filming and going to different locations, they're going to want to see that you have something. And you're not going to be carrying on a briefcase of $5 million or a bond or some kind of line of credit slip. They're, they're legitimately going to want to see something with, that's with a financially strong uh, business partner that can actually pay the claim when and if it comes and arises. So it, it's, a, it's a team approach. Um, also, what I would do, too, as well, is the insurance companies, they want to know, right? So if something maybe slipped through the cracks and wasn't necessarily identified or maybe just wasn't communicated in terms of a risk assessment or what you're going to be doing, that's also a second check and balance that I would end up doing to uh, relate to the insurance company, to negotiate, to make sure that we are capturing and properly covering what it is that you're going to be doing from a production standpoint, but also as well to keep that communication back in the loop to make sure that somebody like Mary Pat or whomever is involved on the legal side is also in the know. So it's, a, it's a really a team approach from my perspective. When, um, when should you, as a production company, if you're setting up a production company or starting a project, when should you be putting insurance in place just like an overall production, not just based on a project, but you as a company? When does that get set up? Uh, as soon as you're you're hiring per person number one, renting that office space, right? If you're getting a writer in there, whatever you're doing from a pre-production standpoint, that's that's moment number one from my takeaway. Yeah. Okay, um, Julian, let's throw this. Let's talk about risk and how do you do a risk assessment, and sure. when do you bring in a risk specialist? Sure. Um, so all, all, all the um, people on the panel today are exactly right. I, I think the, the number one thing is um, clarity and visibility. Um, there is a tendency as a producer to sell big um, and hide the, the, the parts um, which you may not fully understand or you may feel may cause a, an increased legal cost or an increased um, risk management cost or an increased insurance cost. Um, at the end of the day, um, from our experience, um, the risk, the legal, the insurance, and the network, or the studio, or whatever the, the ultimate um, funder of the project is, all actually want the success in the project, and they'd rather identify early where the problems are. So what we do through the risk assessment process, which is formal, is really look for where the problems are. And um, the, the question we, we get a lot, which is actually a really interesting one, is that, hey, I've been told to give you guys a call. I've never done a risk assessment. I've been doing this for 20 years. Um, what do you, why should I do this? And um, my response to them is, once you've gone through the process with us, you'll love it. Um, and, but the one thing that I, we always do is we take on board the experience of the producer that's coming in. And some of them, 20, 30, 40 years experience, um, some are, um, you know, they're selling their first project. So everyone's experience level is different and their life experience that they bring to it is completely different and their approach and attitude is different. So what we do in the risk assessment um, process um, by starting it is a, a questionnaire. Um, we usually get sent a treatment. Um, we look at that um, questionnaire and the, the details that come in on that. And then we do a formal process. We follow a standard, um, which is ISO 31000. Um, and we identify um, what are the safety elements, the safety hazards? What are the security, the medical, the legal and reputational hazards? At the end of the day, you're looking after someone's well-being or the project's well-being, but the, the actual ultimate thing that you're looking after is the brand of either the network or the studio or the production company, because that's, what, that's your goodwill. Um, coming all the way back to the granular, We'll go through and look at what the hazards are. We'll look at what they are from um, familiar risks to unfamiliar risks. There's always a propensity to understand, um, to, un to almost overest sorry, to underestimate the risks that you know and to overestimate the risks that you don't know. So everyone's going to sit there and say, terrorism. But you know, the, um, 
the, the likelihood of actually bumping up against terrorism in the same time and space is actually very low. Um, one of the largest risks on a production is probably motor vehicles um, or just humans. Um, so there's a, there's a whole sort of strategy around that. But we go through a very systematic process of identifying risk. Um, then comes out the, um, the recommendations or the, or the the assessment of that risk, which may be low, uh, medium, high, or extreme. Now, everyone in this room will have a different um, view of what low, medium, and high, and extreme is. And if you are part of a larger organization, that organization may have identified its policy. And that policy might be, what does low mean? What does high mean? Uh, and um, how can we make this acceptable? So the risk assessment begins that conversation. It's a central discussion point where everything arrives. At the end of our risk assessment process, as I said, we provide a series of recommendations. Those recommendations are designed not to tell you what to do. They're, they're tools for you to work out what you want to do. And some of them might be um, recommendations which say, hey, carry on with what you're doing. You're bang on. The other one might be um, some more detail about um, insurance or have you spoken to your, you know, this is something for your attorney or um, it may be that you should um, engage a safety consultant, security consultant, medical consultant. Um, and then at that point, what sort of safety consultant do you need? What's the task that they're actually there to do and perform? What is their qualifications? Are they actually um, qualified to do the job? Because everyone says, hey, I've got this great um, safety consultant and he's X this or she's X that and former this and done this and it's like, okay, that's tremendous. But what is their qualifications around elephants? Well, you know, and it's like, well, at that point, you know, you can be bringing on someone who's super duper, but if, unless they're actually qualified for that particular role, um, all you're doing is ticking a box. It's like getting an insurance policy, which you go, okay, I've got insurance, yay, but unless you actually know the detail of what's insured, where it begins and where it ends, it, it's pointless to you because that's where the gaps are. Um, so there's a, there's a whole lot of detail which we'll dive deep on. Um, and, you know, I think... Uh, a lot of it is really about um, working out who the responsible person on set is and where does the accountability lie. So if you do have a safety person there that, and you've identified that through the risk process, um, that person is feeding the information, good quality information to the accountable person on set or the accountable person for the company. And if you're the company owner or you're the producer, it's probably you. So are you comfortable with the information that you're getting, are you comfortable with the assessment of risk? Risk today right here in this room will vary from risk tomorrow right here in this room. And there will be a whole lot of other factors around it. So it's an ongoing process. And if you kind of view it as an organic process, then what you're doing is adjusting your viewpoint and your, and your, your organization's culture to be um, proactive. And then at that point, you can really actually start to do some exciting uh, content. And as we know, everything's got to be um, bigger, bolder. Um, you know, uh, I, mean, I mean, the classic example is you go back three years and ISIS, if you say the word ISIS, um, everyone has a, um, a, a reaction, which will probably, you know, here's on the back of your neck, stand up. This is hor horrifying, yada, yada. This word and that language has been used over and over that it's now become um, uh, socialized amongst us. And there's obviously a geopolitical change. This actually means that the view around that terminology um, has a different viewpoint. There's an example of how risk can um, change. And you know, as we know, there are camera crews that were in um, Mosul for um, in recent times, and if you actually go back a few years, camera crews would have never gone there. And what's changed? Well, people's analysis of risk, people's analysis of that. So you can actually get closer to the edge and actually have a um, huge opportunity in being able to get content if you know what your risk management process is. So um, once we finish the risk assessment process, that's usually a uh, producer will pass it through to their attorney, pass it through to business affairs, pass it through to the um, insurer, 
and hopefully that becomes uh, a common uh, tool or um, uh, repository of um, information for everyone to be able to then work out what's next. Well, and part of that is when, when and who makes the decisions of how much of that risk assessment actually gets put into place. I think it's a it's a combination because you know we we talk constantly with the networks and studios and they're always interested in finding out what is what's the best way to manage this risk what is what actually is the risk on it a production company will have certain people that are involved they will have different levels of expertise like yourself who will come in and say look this feels really good I think we've got a plan in place. Um, and we can proceed based upon the information we've got. Conversely, you can actually can get, we've got so much information on this, this actually confirms our fears that this thing is not doable or we're going to manage it in this sort of certain way. So I think the, you know, who, who does it? It should really be everyone has a, um, has, a, has a say in it. But at the end of the day, it's the person who's going to end up in the dock um, that's the most important one and we know all the stories that have gone on in recent times and we've seen cases um, you know for something to get as far as a courtroom it, it, there's been a lot of negligence uh, to get there or at least there's a question of negligence to get there um, but it's all the other stuff which actually is the hidden costs it's the hidden costs of an insurance claim you never get back to the same point you were with insurance because you've got you lack business continuity, your, your production's been stopped down, you're, you're suddenly going to be fearful about how you go about doing something. And insurance is golden, but at the end of the day, what you actually want to do is never get to a point where you actually have to make a claim. Um, the, the legal side of it is absolutely golden as well, but you actually never want to be into a point where you actually have to test the letter of that contract. Um, and so I think... Um, you need to look at who the responsible person is, and then that person makes those decisions. And at the end of the day, there's always one person on the set who's responsible, there's always one person in the company, and the buck stops for them. I, can, I think that that's something, in, in it's important to identify who that person is. And I can comment on this too from an indie perspective. For us, it's, it's usually one or the other. One is that it is an independent production that was picked up by a studio or network before you ever get started, right? So the buck stops with the studio or the network and you can do your development and you can talk to me and the insurance carrier and everybody else, but at the end of the day, that information is brought to someone like Stephanie and we say, here's what we got and here's our, our assessment of the risk, but they're gonna say yay or nay. And so they're the ones making the decision. But on the other side, we also work with a lot of productions that I'm sure you guys are a part of where it doesn't have a destination yet. You you um, were able to fund and greenlight this project through a variety of ways, through equity and through tax credits and everything else, but you don't actually know where it's going. And so the buck stops with the lead producer. Now, the issue there is obviously that's you have to make that decision based on what risk we've put out there, what the insurance carrier has put out there, what you know you know from your own experience. But what I find, right, is that you decide I'm going to proceed and then we get to the point of post or we get into production or post and something goes wrong or we've got a project but then we can't find a destination for it because of certain risks that perhaps we, we should have dealt with and decided that we should move forward and maybe we shouldn't have. So I think when you don't already have a destination for your project, you really have to be thinking um, long term, this is a project that I'm going to want someone to pick up later and they're not going to want to pick up the expenses that might come with perhaps um, taking too many risks or uh, having to deal with things with the footage now post-production. Um, so it's just something to think about. Um, and to really use the resources that you do have. If you don't have a whole um, panel of experts, um, at, at least use the experts you do have and really put your heads together so that you're not dealing with something um, after the fact, which can be a lot more expensive. And you don't want your project dead in the water uh, after you've already put it together. And that is something we see a lot too, where you've already made this project and now it can't go anywhere because um, 
uh, certain decisions were made in the beginning that uh, didn't fully assess the risk. Um, I think one other aspect of the risk analysis, if you are on the studio side or the network side, is brand. And this is kind of to Kate's point, which is if you've got something that might in some way tarnish the brand itself, that that's a risk that could have huge implications. And there is no insurance that covers that. Um, and that could even be at the risk assessment side if you're a production company and it's been sold. You know, it's part of as the network and you're calculating, are we comfortable with this or not? It's do we want to be the person or the brand that's now going to be associated with children getting hurt? Do we want to be the brand associated with sex offenders? And, you know, creatively, it can be a really exciting show, but if it's going to hurt the brand to the point where they're not going to have advertisers or they'll lose um, viewership, these are all things that really affect their bottom line. It may be your dream show to put together or your dream film, but it's going to hurt them so much that they're just going to be like, I'm not going to take it. So that might be something, especially if you're not already attached to a network, that you can hear where their risk tolerance is. Something to keep in the back of your mind. If I'm selling this, what if I'm, I'm looking at this and I've got a big brand, do I want this as part of that, that family? And if it's too risky, their people are just going to walk away. They're going to say, I, I just, I can't take that because, you, you know, it's not just the insurance costs or the cost of somebody being in the hospital. It's, you know, you could be talking millions of dollars. And that, that's a lot when you stop to think about it that way. You know, maybe you are on the hook for a couple hundred thousand, but the network's like, this is millions. Is that what happened with that? I'm sorry. What happened with that? That that was an aspect of it. I mean, they had done a risk analysis and had concluded that it was fine to put on. But then when they started promoting it, the people started going, wait a second, this feels like you're normalizing something that's really not normal. We don't want n hate to look like it's a okay thing, like because the show is really trying to portray, as best as I understand it, you know, how these are seemingly normal people and these kids are just kids. They just happen to be members of the KKK. And, and I mean, it was supposed to be a walk of life, exposing people to something that they didn't know. I think it was trying to maybe even some ways they thought bridge the hate gap that we've got going on in this country. But obviously the reaction from their viewers and their advertisers was, whoa, what are you thinking? Um, we don't want to be associated with normalizing hate. Uh, or even if it's, I just don't want my name with the KKK in the same sentence. So it may, so there, as a result, you know, A&E obviously made the choice, you know what, it's going to cost our brand too much, let's walk away. A flip side of that would be when, if you look at, again, with A&E, Duck Dynasty, you had the patriarch come out and make horribly anti-gay comments. They slapped him on the wrist and then kept airing new episodes. That really confused the viewership. And people stopped tuning in. And they thought, oh, because we told them we, we, he, we weren't going to shoot anymore during this production break, like, everyone would be happy. The ratings never recovered from that. It always took that hit. So there is that brand impact that, you know, do I, do I want to be with that? And sometimes they don't think it all the way through. They think, you know, we, we're all guilty of that, oh, what was I thinking moment? I mean, those are, those are great points too, because it kind of falls outside of the spectrum of insurance, but let me tie it back to insurance a little bit. So I work with a, a client that does a lot of children's programming. So even some of the most mundane things, and I'm just thinking if you don't, if you have a project that doesn't necessarily have a destination yet, you know, that client might just be very sensitive to what they're representing to their, their audience viewership base, right? So this client shows that we don't want to show uh, a, a kid sliding down a stair rail, right? Because the potential of somebody emulating that in the real world and falling down and slipping saying, now I'm hurt, it's because I watched the show. Right? So that kind of thing, from an insurance standpoint, sliding down the stair rail, not, a, not an issue. Right? You can get that covered back through a, a liability policy, but from a brand awareness perspective, it presents something entirely different. You know? And going to the Duck Dynasty comment, there is an insurance tieback that you can look at. I mean, it really would speak more to, I guess, the distributor or the studio or whoever you're, you're working with, but there are scenarios, it's called disgrace coverage, that you can put into place that if a if a lead key person is of such value to that series, that franchise, if they were to do something that was just such against public decency and disgrace, i.e. they're making 
whatever socio political comments. They go off and they, you know, commit some kind of criminal act, and the brand loses value. You can have an insurance policy step in and provide some level of protection. Certainly, some brands are so valuable that it's you're not going to be able to get enough insurance capacity to to cover that. But at least there is a an option, and it's a developing market. But there is an option to go and do that. So. Yeah, I think the the issues that I've seen ha come up more often is we don't people don't realize that that person may be that integral, and then it sort of comes out of the woodwork. I think you've seen that on a number of Discovery and TLC shows in the past, where uh, you know we 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 did everything right, we ran background checks, we mitigated our risk, and then it turns out somebody did something very questionable, and now again from a brand perspective, you're just sort of sitting there going, "What can I do?" And you probably don't have a policy in place like that. I think if you've got, if you're a network and you've got like that one main star that you can clearly identify, then that might be something to look into just in case something goes off the rails. Yeah, and there's always, you know, going but looking back, I always provides perspective. But even at the time, you could have a star that's just driving the show, and you're like, this is my money maker, and you're still like, well, they're they're never gonna do that. They're right. You look back to Tiger Woods pre, you know, pre the whole thing. <laughs> Nobody would have guessed it, right? But the the capital that the loss of revenues to all of his endorsers was, you know, yeah. very, very significant. So, but at the times, you know, we don't need insurance. So just kind of keep that in mind. If, if, if something's really driving a lot of, you know, revenue and cash flow gains to you, it's, it's worth having at least the dialogue and discussion to bring that to whoever the right decision maker is. So what are some of the ways that, that within all the, the areas that you guys cover, that creative can be maintained and maintain that integrity while still preventing risk? I, I, you, you can't prevent risk. You can reduce it. It can never get to zero. Mm -hmm. um, I personally believe you can film anything, anywhere. It's all doable. It comes down to um, what's your budget and what's your appetite for risk. And at the end of the day, you're going to make a decision around how much you can afford to mitigate versus how much you can afford to absorb. Um, and there are companies out there that are doing some pretty bold um, uh, content. They're leaning into risk. Um, you know, we can probably think of the names of those, those companies now. And they are um, growing an audience. And they're doing some stuff which is pretty dynamic. And, they, um, and they're accepting that the audience may or may not like uh, some of the content aspects of it, but they're sitting there going, well, this is our space. Um, more traditional studios and networks um, will have a more um, bedded in approach around that. So um, when it comes to the creative, I think um, when you're looking at risk, you get in early. You understand what that is. Um, as, as Stephanie said, if you go and sell um, a show and then you find out that there's a high risk element of, into it and you can't afford it, well then you really haven't prepared yourself before you've gone to the marketplace. Um, I think you need to sit there and say, okay, we're wanting to do this. Let's understand what the risk is. Let's have a really honest discussion with the people that can manage the physical side of it, the granular, um, through to the legal and the other aspects of it that will protect the organization. <laughs> because at the end of the day, it's business and you're, you're protecting the business and you're protecting your business partners, and you're protecting the people that are involved um, in, the, in the delivery of that project. So I think um, when, you, when you're looking at the creative, you need to sit there and say, okay, am, am, I, um, am I happy where this is going? Am I understanding what the risk is? And I'm always a firm believer that if there's a high risk element of it, make it part of the creative. You know, don't, don't um, hide from it. We're seeing more and more projects now that are breaking the fourth wall and saying, you know, here's our guy, he's doing this and pull wide and here's all the safety that's in place and here's all the security in place. It's adding value to the perception that this is actually a real risk as opposed to a cartoon risk. Um, we've, we, we see a lot of projects. Um, I mean, pretty much um, if, we're, if we're not directly involved in it, we've, we've got some conversation with um, a huge amount of um, projects that are happening um, in the US and in other parts of the world which look at um, uh, risky endeavors. Um, we see a lot of hosts that are extremely talented. Um, 
that are well prepared before they go on to location um, and have a perception of um, uh, perhaps upping the risk for for the creative. Um, sometimes it's real, sometimes it's um, it's a it's a it's a creative arc. I think the um, interesting thing about it is, is just constantly going back and having a look at what are these um, creative opportunities that we're trying to um, put across and how can we manage it at the end of the day because um, what you actually do want is a positive outcome, not a negative outcome. And I think we all know the stories about lots of you know, negative outcomes that can occur. Um, it's what we call isomorphic learning, which is really learning from other people's mistakes. And we, we're constantly um, listening to, you know, this person's got this great idea for a show, they're gonna go and do X, Y, and Z, and then there's a, um, that they come up against a, a hard landing on something. Um, what's fascinating is actually seeing where that decision point um, exited from being a positive outcome to a negative outcome. And you can always see that there's a chain of events. There's always one decision point which then becomes a negative outcome. And that might be around the legal framework, it may be around um, what's been um, disclosed, it may be around um, the, the physical management risk, or it, it may be right back to the very nub of the creative. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, the, the understanding is at what point does, did your project depart from a positive outcome to become a negative outcome? And everything actually can be managed um, through that process. It's just working out where you're prepared to make a decision and you're creative um, to um, either absorb or, or mitigate that risk. When in that kind of a situation where you have a host who does something like that, who comes in and, and is trying to up the ante, and I'm going to throw this over to, to Toby. So where does insurance play in that? If you know you've got an event that's that this guy's covered, both as a host and as part of the project, when that steps up suddenly, where does insurance play in that, and, and what kind of lines are you looking at? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm of a similar opinion where I, I feel like what we do at ANLG Ribbon is our, our we're the broker, right? So we're not the insurance company. So I, th I like to think of it as like we're kind of like the therapist. Tell us everything that you have going on, and we'll tell you if it's safe or not. And you know, be able to have a you know a proactive dialogue to say, this is going to fit with the parameters of insurance. This is something we're going to have to work through with, be it legal or risk assessment, to find a solution that's going to work. And you know, as Julian mentioned, there's there's you can get something insured most likely, there's just going to be a cost to it and it's weighing those pros and cons. So if we go in with a plan, like with anything, it's all about a proactive dialogue. So you can go in with your creative plan, you can go in with something and I can rubber stamp it and say, this has been approved, but guess what, the next day something changed, the host wants to do something or the creative's gone in a totally different direction. It's just about having another set of dialogue and then we can go back and basically get it covered because that's what my job is and again we it's a it's a team approach to make sure that everybody's in the know you know legal sign off on it the risk assessment still looks good and like, we can get the insurance taken care of that way too and I think that some of that has to do with the people everybody talking to each other um, and and production and I know from experience that a lot of times creative will look one way and producers are afraid to tell you what they're really going to do. And that is a big deal. The, the, and, sca the scared of people to say no. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and the other side of it is they're afraid of what it's going to cost. And you have to consider it. And it's, it's really not a good thing to come in after the fact. Because that's probably going to cost you more and might cause you to not be able to do what you want to do. But if you talked about it up front and were really clear about what you were doing, there are other things that you can put in place and that's going to that's going to move me into the the hiring of experts. Of when you're looking at high risk and nobody and and I know that from race that we do a lot of high risk things and we make sure that we hire experts to come in 
and lay the groundwork. And we give them the opportunity when we're out on the road in some foreign country, somebody who is the safety expert and the one who has helped set things up has the authority to say, no, you can't do this. And that can be just because of weather. It can be because something isn't working the way it's supposed to. And we run live. We really do. And they have the power to say, no go. And that's something that you have to be prepared for and be aware of and, and think about those opportunities of, of what are you going to do if that happens? How do you take care of that? But the other side of it is, is how do you find the experts and, and, and looking at what due diligence is, both from a, a risk and a legal, um, because legal comes in a lot here, um, as well as insurance. What is your due diligence and how do you find these experts and what do you, how do you find their qualifications? So I'm going to throw that to you guys. I could, I could start with this one. Um, something, again, for us, it definitely depends on the project and who's involved from the beginning. Um, but something that we will do, and, and you should, and I'm sure most of you are doing this already, is think about who the project is attached to. So, for example, with independent productions, we do do a lot with um, Netflix, right? Netflix original content and things like that. Well, they have several vendors that they work with, and same with, you know, Stephanie from the network side. They're going to have several vendors that they've worked with over time, or several consultants that they've worked with over time, and, and they. And so it's worth it to start there, I think, right? That if that's where your project is, is going at the end of the day and you're going to need, you know, certain ex let's say you're shooting in Hungary, right? Well, where do you even start in terms of figuring out who the right experts are for shooting in Hungary? Well, start with the people that you know, okay? If this is, you know, a, a project that is going to a network or it's a project that is um, going to Netflix, okay, then go to Netflix and say, have you ever done a production that was in Hungary or do you have any suggestions of, of people that we could reach out to? So we always start there. Um, but then the other thing is, you know, when you are working with uh, a legal team that is with a firm or with a studio, over time we create our own database of people that we trust and that we respect and that we know have the expertise that we need when it's time to call on them. So, you know, that's another thing, too, is um, we ourselves will have a referral list because what we do is so narrow, right? We are helping you with the production legal, but we're not going to be helping with the risk assessment or with insurance or with shooting in a foreign country. We're going to need to be able to bring on other experts. And so that is the starting point. Um, and, uh, and, and kind of using the circle that you have and then when you do find someone also that you uh, really felt did a good job keeping them in your Rolodex to make sure that you call on them again. Um, you know, just sort of jumping off of what, what Kate has said, uh, one of our shows at Electus is Running Wild with Bear Grylls. So we are constantly in very different areas where we're globe trotting. We're doing all kinds of different, somewhat risky maneuvers. Whether it's you know, uh, climbing down glaciers or, uh, you know, being in some very remote location with that's very hot without water. Like, how are we going to handle this? And we and once a week for that show, or rather per episode, I should say, I have a call with my local facilitator, um, my safety experts, and um, other my other outside production legal so that we sit down and we discuss like the specific risk for each program and what we've done to mitigate that risk. An example to that is, you know, we were filming one of the episodes uh, that will be airing hopefully soon. And there was gunfire not far from where we were filming because we were in a very remote location and you had these two tribes sort of getting into it. And it was a conversation of, do we need to move our production further inland by another, you know, mile or two just to get us a better buffer or what, you know, what did our safety experts say on the ground about like what was going on? And there's a lot of 
where we defer to that expert. You know, that's why we brought him on. And how did we get this person? Why are we listening to him? Well, on something like Running Wild with Bear Grylls, it's been on for a lot of seasons. We, like Kate said, we have this Rolodex. In addition, that's one of the things you're looking for in your facilitator. If you've got a facilitator that you trust, that's somebody who's going to be able to tell you, hey, in Hungary, I have this really great aerial safety guy. Or if you're in Taiwan, this is the guy, if you're going to be rappelling down a cliff, you need to be using. And that, that's why you vet your facilitator so incredibly thoroughly, because you want to be able to rely on them. I mean, we can always take somebody from L.A. that we know and fly into these things, but there's a cost involved in that, too. So you're ba balancing that out. Do you trust your facilitator? Do you trust the person that they've recommended? That doesn't mean you don't vet them. You still want to see you know, what their certs of insurance are, what their resume is. What do they have that they've done before that you can look at and be like, OK, hey, you did this for a CBS show. You worked with Amazing Race. Let me call Mary Pat and see what her experience was with him. And that's all part of it. And just getting together the information so that, again, when you're on the ground and it's like, oh, we're going to be ice repelling today. It's like, oh, OK. Sounds fantastic. Please don't make me do that. Uh, but why? Why do I? Am, why am I able to sleep at night and not think like, oh my gosh, Bear's going to die? Not just because he actually does have some experience doing it, but also I know my safety team has been running tests and they they run it at, before we put our talent and our guest star in that situation, so that they've figured out where the, something might go wrong, and we've tried to mitigate it as much as possible. Did you have President Obama? Yes, we did. And how did that? Work? That was very um, unique because we had a sitting president. So we actually had a very remote part of Alaska. It was a longer shoot um, because we actually had to like st break everything down, put him in a hotel. Like he does not camp. He doesn't have to camp. Uh, other, <laughs> other people do. Presidents do not. I, I know. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if we brought a senator if we would do that for them. So it's, I really do think there, there is that like line. Uh, but we, we had to have like all the airspace around where we were filming was shut down. We had special uh, helicopters from the Secret Service that was flying. We actually had to use some of their stuff because we couldn't even fly our own uh, helicopters and things like that because they had just shut everything down. Uh, one of the other interesting parts is usually Bear has uh, his guest star eat something really kind of weird and gross. You Again, things you don't do to a president. He got to have salmon. <laughs> um, and al although uh, it, it certainly looked like a bear had started off eating it, as far as I know, no wild animals actually touched the food because it had to be tested but because they had to make sure it wasn't poisoned. So we just had lots of steps that sort of changed a little bit of the creative, but it was completely worth it so that we could have a sitting president on the show, talk about climate change, and also we got to showcase this amazing scene in Alaska, which was kind of incredible. Um, I think they even did like a behind the scenes episode about the safety precautions and like how it was such a different shoot for us. Because again, we we had this person who, like, he couldn't fall off the side of a glacier. That just wasn't an option. Like, that <laughs> risk had to be zero. <laughs> I would just add to that that certainly working within your own network of contacts is the preferred route, right? From an insurance standpoint, you know, the insurance markets aren't in a position. They're not going to question, like, who are you using typically. It'd be a very rare instance for that to happen. They're going to ask for a resume. They're going to want to know the experience because they're relying upon the fact that you've really vetted them and most typically have worked with them in the past. So as long as the, the IMDB or their resume looks to be in order, you're typically you're gonna get a, okay, we're comfortable with using this person. So it really just comes back to working within your existing networks and the trust factor there. Um, so I'd actually dive a bit deeper than I think you're all completely correct. Um, at the end of the day, the expertise needs to match the framework. Um, you need to understand what the skill set is of that person. Um, I think, um, word of mouth and you know these other ways of being able to start the conversation is great, but uh, that's where um, your due diligence then should actually start. Um, is there are there qualifications um, fit for purpose? Are there qualifications um, current? Um, do they understand the landscape or the environment that they're in? And yes, there are incredibly talented um, safety people in uh, California that can deploy uh, all over the world, but are they actually the right person to be in that environment? 
um, uh, does their skill set um, completely marry up for the jurisdictional requirement? So you can actually deploy a medical person into another country where they may be fully qualified uh, in California, but for them to actually operate um, and to provide any medical services in a different jurisdiction will actually expose your, you and your company to legal liability. Um, do they have the ability to actually manage um, the task? Are they actually able to work in with a production? Have they done production work before? Do they understand the dynamics of not only the production company, the network, um, but then also if there's any stars or anyone else that's in that space? Do they actually have the ability to communicate to the accountable person on set that um, this is the preferred or the desired path and these are the reasons why? Why am I making decisions um, uh, in this instance? Sometimes you might want let, to let things run. Sometimes you need to actually um, be a lot more um, constricted in that framework. Um, does the safety or the specialist consultant have the ability to understand um, uh, all of these elements as well as doing their job and actually be proactive? So what you actually don't want to come up against is a no, what you want to do is be constantly coming up against a yes because what you're doing is channeling the, um, uh, the requirements so that the production's going uh, down that path correctly. Um, the person's got to be able to offer advice to the responsible person uh, on set. Now, um, you can use your Rolodex, you can use um, who you know, you can use IMDB, and you should use all of that, 100%. But um, there are companies like Global Film Solutions that um, actually have that global network where we, we know that this person has worked on this show, we've done due diligence on them, we understand um, the precise needs of working in um, a former Eastern uh, or Eastern European former Soviet bloc country um, where their insurance requirements are actually completely different to your insurance requirements here because it's a socialistic system. So therefore they don't have the insurance to the um, public liability or the professional indemnity level that you would expect here. And, um, and how that folds in to the requirements is that you may actually not even be able to get this person's insurance if they're your safety person in that place to be able to meet your minimum standard which then goes back to your legal framework of how you're employing that person. So um, one of the um, skill sets that we uh, operate as our minimum standard when we deploy um, consultants, and we deploy a lot of them, is um, that they have a medical qualification, that they have a safety qualification, and that they have a security qualification. Because if you've got a production, you don't actually want to have three people on set when one person can do all of that, and then making sure that you understand the framework that that person is doing business in on your behalf. Um, what are the drugs that can be administered? What are the elements? Um, and do you need to actually bring someone else in? Can you actually transport um, certain meds over borders? Um, what is the um, uh, standard that that person comes from their jurisdictional uh, background? So for instance, we had a project which we were shooting in Cyprus. It was a mixed gas deep sea diving uh, shoot. We wanted to bring in a um, dive supervisor out of the UK. Um, it was a New Zealand production for an American company in Cyprus. So now we're starting to have multi, multiple jurisdictions. We knew that if we brought in the dive supervisor from the UK, that the person would be uh, cheaper to fly their equipment would be cheaper to get there than if we bought from somewhere else. But when you actually dive deep, excuse the pun, on um, the uh, um, jurisdictional um, elements that would come in with him being a UK citizen under HSE, um, we realized that it was gonna put a, 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 an increased financial burden on the show when actually bringing someone in from the Turks and Caicos Islands, which we did, um, our minimum standard was met through um, OSHA, um, but we didn't actually have to put that extra financial cost on it. So, and that covered any excess baggage issues of um, specialist dive gear that we had to ship in. So it's, it's always looking at what is the right person, what's the right landscape, and sometimes 
crews go, oh, we work with this guy, he's great, or she's awesome, love her, and she fits in really well, but may not actually be the right person for the job, even though the crew enjoys their company and they've been really fantastic. So it's, it's, a, it's a real balance and constantly um, uh, shifting. And the hardest thing is when you actually have someone who's been involved in the show for a long time um, and may not actually be the right person for a particular shoot or a particular outcome, and that's when you need to bring in someone else. Yeah, uh, I would just add, I think, you know, having the right person seems like a no-brainer, but especially when you're dealing in foreign territories, having somebody that is knowledgeable in that given field or that area is key. I'll give you an example. I had a production filming in uh, Miramar, Myanmar, and, you know, this was a one case where the insurance company did want to make sure that there was actually a local fixer or a security guy that could kind of maneuver through the landscape. And a perfect example of, like, while you can risk assess and you can kind of get your you know, your point to zero, say, I've, I've looked at every possible risk scenario. I'll be frank with you, you probably haven't, and I'll give you a great example of that. In Miramar, there's one bridge that goes in and out of the city. This bridge just so happened to collapse, preventing anybody from getting in and out. The reason it collapsed is because the locals down there would take off the nuts and bolts to use it for their bicycle parts, or they would use it to sell it. So they basically caused the bridge to collapse. Something you would never think about, right? Because you're focused on how am I taking care of my talent, my cast, my crew. You're not thinking about is the bridge going to have structural integrity to it, right? <laughs> so the, the key importance, though, is that the fact that you had a, we had a local expert there that was there guiding the production around because they were, they were stalled and now like what would end up being like an eight-hour traffic jam. And because of that traffic jam, some local hoodlums started to go from car to car to car robbing people. And without that local person being there to basically guide and take them on like a, what was a four hour, you know, route against away from the bridge, you know, my production could have been endangered and subject to loss from theft and, you know, other traumas that could have potentially happened. So, you know, you can plan for everything, but there's always going to be something outside of that. So again, having local true people that you know and trust that know the area or know the, whether it's a pyrotechnician or where it's going to be, I think is... I don't want to undervalue that statement. Yeah, I think from from one of the things that we deal with a lot is whether it's the safety experts or the high risk experts, or even getting into your helicopter pilots. Your when we're hiring or we're having our facilitators hire, and I know that this isn't just our show, but we require. Every license we want to see on an aircraft, we want to see the maintenance records, we want to see their insurance, we want to make sure we're added to the insurance when we'll get into all of the, the nitty gritty of the details of that kind of stuff. Um, we want to see, know exactly who the pilot is, we want to look at that license and make sure that it's valid because truly I've been sent invalid licenses and had to go back and say, either get me the current license or get me a different pilot because we need to know and we need to know that they're certified for that aircraft and I need to know that everything has been done to make sure that the person who's going up even if it's it's simply the cameraman going up to do aerials um, but you want to do that if you've got anybody jumping out of a plane which we do <laughs> and any of those kinds of things, um, you want to get that documentation and, and we run it by our legal. Our legal, you know, I look at all of this stuff, but I can, I can miss something. Our producers look at it before I see it and I catch things. And our legal team catches things where they come back. You have to also look at things of how dates are written in other countries and you look at something and think it's valid and then somebody else looks at it and says, oh no, but in that country it's written this way and that's not a valid license. So there's there's little details of things that you need to be looking at or making sure that there is somebody that is looking at and you know who that person is. And legal does the same thing. And all of that documentation that we do goes to legal, but also goes to our, our insurers, and goes to our foreign brokers who look at what we have to make sure that we've covered all the bases as far as those things go. Um, for our for our guys who are rigging somebody coming off of a mountain, we need to know that they've got the certifications, and as Julian said, that they can work in that country, 
that they're going to be able to do that and that their insurance is going to be valid in that country. And that gets into a whole thing about jurisdictions and, and um, you know, making sure that your insurance probably isn't going to be a worldwide policy. So what you want to be looking at is looking to your facilitators to make sure that they're getting a policy that meets your minimums and meets your standards, but also then gets into making sure that you're covered so that you're on that policy as well. So it all gets into that, that gets into sort of the nitty gritty of how do you do this stuff um, and what you should be asking for and those kinds of things. But the, the, the very beginning of it with your stunts and your experts and your all of the crazy things that everybody likes to do and are fun to watch and see on screen is making sure that you're getting that paperwork, that backup that says that they are who they say they are and has it valid, has it current. Um, I think that's more, you know, one of those small things that people don't like to think about, but you want to do it um, just to make sure that you are safe because that will destroy your production if something happens. It all comes back to you. It all comes back to the network and the studio, and and your production will just go down the tubes if that's not dealt with. But just one other thing on that is, I mean, obviously you're, um, you, you don't want to end up in a, some sort of civil claim, but with um, health and safety in different jurisdictions, it actually can be a criminal um, mm -hmm. uh, outcome. So in the UK, there's criminal negligence around health and safety. I um, mean, that's becoming more and more. And, and obviously in, um, you know, some of the um, third world countries, you know, you actually can be dragged off um, to the police station, you know, if you have something happens in that space. So, you know, it's not just a financial outcome. It actually can be a, um, a, a criminal outcome as well. Worst case scenario. So for, for our legal team, so what, when you're looking at a contract, what do you need to put in that contract with an expert to make sure that you're taken care of? Honestly, with, with respect to the stuff we're talking about today, it's the provisions that people always glance over and they're like, I don't need to read that one. Um, that are the ones that are the most important when you're talking about safety and risk. Um, and, and so obviously, we're going to take the time to review um, these provisions, but it's also something that you need to be paying particular attention to, which is the, um, the language about insurance and the language about um, indemnification. And, and I think the starting point, one, is that you want to make sure that what is in this contract matches with what your insurance carrier is telling you. It, it needs to be in this contract or what you need in order to proceed. Um, but, uh, you know, at the, at the same time, I guess what I find a lot is that, is that producer will, will just glance over it and they're like, it, it, this part doesn't really matter. Um, and so, uh, I, I think the most important thing, honestly, is that you, especially when you're talking about a show where there are going to be serious safety concerns, those are some of the most important provisions in there. And that is something that it's different from case to case, but we will kind of um, work with the insurance carrier to make sure we know everything that needs to be in there so that we can protect you via contract, not just via insurance. Uh, what I would probably add to that is I would sit down, I typically will sit down with my production team, especially if we've got a safety issue, to get flesh out exactly what the services are. And that's something I want to get really detailed because to Julian's point, it needs to be somebody who knows what they're doing in that area. And I actually will add something usually to the reps and warranties that says you're going to do this and render these services in a first class manner. And you are representing you're an expert so that when we're relying on you, we're, we have, we've actually increased the threshold of your liability. You're holding yourself out as an expert. You're not just some guy who likes guns. You are an armorer and you have extensive experience with these types of guns and you know and understand how this can go wrong. You regularly are responsible for cleaning and storing and maintaining guns of this nature. And that's all things that, again, they may not really pay that much attention to, for better or for worse. Um, 
but I really care about because if something goes wrong, and even though the likelihood of something going wrong may be very small, if it does, it's one more thing that I have to protect my client to say, hey, look, they hired a first class armorer. Here's all of this person's experience. Here's all of the person's licenses. Here's everything that we did to make sure this person was an expert. And by the way, they held themselves out that way. And so if something went wrong with that gun, we have one more person to kind of be like, it's not on us. And from that brand perspective, you want it to be like, hey, we didn't do that. Yeah, and, and having that due diligence, I think, is key, especially if a claim scenario comes up. Because if that person were to misrepresent themselves and were to result in a claim where somebody gets injured, if you've gone through that due diligence, you see it, it's, it's outlined in the contract. Um, the insurance companies, you know, it's not going to give the insurance company an out to, you know, not protect you. Right. They might say the armor is on its own, his or her own. But, you know, from your production standpoint, you know, you're still going to be covered in the event that somebody else is bringing a suit against you as a result of what that armor did because you've gone through due diligence there. Just on a um, really practical level, when, once you're on set and you've got someone that's gone through that due diligence and all that other process, if there is a feeling that the person um, cannot meet the obligations or you feel that they're not um, getting up to that, you need to talk up, speak up really quickly because it's you need to replace that person out. There's no point sitting there saying, look, this person's the person who's hired, but if people are feeling unsafe or they're feeling like they're not doing it, um, you're much better to deal with that and deal with the embarrassment of it than deal with a negative outcome. At some, and you know, ev everyone goes into these things with the best intentions, but sometimes um, the creative morphs, um, mission creep comes in, you know, there's a larger skill set required. Um, it's in everyone's um, interest, including perhaps the safety person um, who's not measuring up um, to replace out. And don't be embarrassed about it. Just deal with it and, and get on with it. And that goes into the termination provision as yeah. well, which, which is another one that people will glance over. Um, but honestly, I find that's the one that comes up the most where I get the call, can we fire this guy? Right. And then I'm like, well, let me look back at the contract and let's see what we can do. And the way that it comes up is that you're balancing your budget versus risk. Right. Because sometimes what will happen is that the you know, if we if we didn't do our due diligence and also really put um, the language into the contract, then it might say that you've got to pay him, right, X amount, regardless of whether you terminate. Well, now you're thinking, okay, well, now I need to pay this guy all this amount of money, but I'm also going to have to hire a new person to get, actually get the job done. And suddenly you're like, I don't know if our budget can handle it. And you're now thinking about keeping on someone that is not doing their job, which is is the last thing that you'd want. So, so I think, you know, I guess that the takeaway on, on this, this question is the provisions that you you don't tend to look at, right? Because you're always zoning in on um, money. The, the money, and you're like, that's the only provision that matters. But the reps and warranties are really important. S specifics about the services are really important. The specifics about insurance and indemnification are really important. But also the termination and really thinking, okay, if 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 things go awry, you know, can we get out of this contract? And if we can, how much we're we gonna have to pay? Et cetera, et cetera. So it's just really important um, because that that does come up a lot that you got to replace someone mid production. And, and just to build off of that, um, in a you know in the termination provision, at least where I always like to start is everybody is at will. That way you can terminate them for a good reason, a bad reason, or no reason. And especially if they're at will, don't give them a reason. Um, but going back to what Julian was saying, if there is somebody who's not working out. We really don't know, okay? I'm in my office, I've moved on to project number two. Like, I, nobody calls me to tell me when things are going great. They only call me when something goes wrong. <laughs> it's like my phone rings and it's always, oh great, what happened now? <laughs> um, wish you guys would call and tell us when it's a good day, for right. the record. <laughs> but, but to that extent, you are also our eyes and ears. So if you're in the field and somebody isn't really following safety procedures or this person isn't giving you that nice, warm, fuzzy feeling, that's a good time to call me or call Kate or whomever your production legal is to, or your EIC to say, hey, I've got some concerns because there's so much I can do before things go wrong. You know, 
to Kate's point, if if it's the person's not at will, maybe there might be a potential breach going on if they're not living up to those services. And that might be a way to get out of the contract without paying a guarantee. Um, the other factor that I would usually also bring in to that cost benefit analysis, how much is that lawsuit going to cost you? Because it could be, you may be doubling a line item and reaching into your pocket is nothing we ever want to do. Um, but personally, I'd rather see you spend 15, an extra $15,000 than a lawsuit that could cost you a million dollars. Like, and that's just to defend. Because insurance may or may not now take care of it depending on what they feel was reasonable under the circumstances. And that also gets into another provision of the contract, <laughs> which is this jurisdiction. Is the I, I know, we could go on and on about the contract, but that the jurisdiction and the venue and also whether there's arbitration and all of these different things are things, again, people are just like, I don't need to read that one. And they kind of move on. But if you're talking about a production that is taking place in several different places in the world, for one, that venue or jurisdiction language might not be the U.S., right? And so then there's also just that. <laughs> not, not, not in my world. <laughs> yeah. um, not in the studio world. But like... You, so we, there's, we, there's, we insist on it, even when we're filming. There's so many, you know, elsewhere different things, right, to, to take into consideration. If you actually had to go that route, where it then becomes litigious, okay, well, per the contract, we are forced to do arbitration first, and we're forced to do it in this state or you know, whatever the case mm -hmm. might be, right? So those things also come into that uh, kind of budget analysis as well, and and the best thing you can do, right, is to to deal with it early, so that. Uh, because that is always going to be the more expensive route. Somebody, question, yes. Quick question with that differences between independent contractor, alumni corporation, or as an employee with regards to the situation. Sure. Um, so an independent contractor agreement can be either with a loan out or with an individual. Essentially what it's saying is we're, we aren't, we're hiring you, but we're not your employer of record. That's somebody else. We're engaging you to render these services, and um, without getting into too much of the boring minutia, under the tax code, there's like a 12-step test to determine whether or not you are truly an independent contractor and, or an employee. And depending on which way you fall in affects what benefits need to be paid, taxes that are withheld, and things like that. So an independent contractor agreement at least starts you off down the road of, you are not my employee. and. Um, the reason I would want to do that, especially with something like uh, a safety expert, is I don't want to have that liability of being the employer necessarily. Um, the reason you go through a loan out for is usually for tax purposes, and that's really something you and your CPA will figure out if that's the right fit for you. When we engage a loan out, we usually I usually have a writer that says like the loan out is representing and warranting that they're lending the services of you individual, and then the individual signs something saying, I'm only gonna look to my lender to be paid, and I'm only gonna look to my lender for insurance and things like that, because I'm not providing that as an employer. You're an independent contractor. You need to get that on your own. And again, these go to elements in that test to say whether or not you are or aren't an independent contractor. But these are all things that I can use to kind of help me. And if if it's giving you tax benefits, chances are you already have your workers' comp through your loan out. You already have your health insurance through your loan out. So it's not like you need me to provide them. You already have it. If I'm engaging somebody as an employee, now I either need to put them in to a payroll company or another mechanism. For me, it's always been a payroll company where that that payroll company will be the one who's providing workers' comp. That is the, they're going to hold, withhold taxes. So instead of filling out a W-9, it's going to be a W-2. So it affects your paperwork. And then, again, because of the way I like to structure things for my client, um, the payroll company is the employer of record. So that it, let's say you, you slip and fall and you break your leg, you go to the hospital and you, you know your your bills are all going to be paid for, but it's going to be through the payroll company's workers' comp. It's not going to be a claim on Electus's workers' comp, and that just goes to what it, how it could affect our premiums. Because as Julian said, the biggest danger is people. We we just fall. I it's it's like gravity it just has that effect on us, especially when we're running quickly. Sometimes with employees, I mean they meet maybe a lot of you know, in that whole 
question of liability and extra clauses in the contract you know, that becomes a legal issue and whether they will assume the liability or they're asking the question. Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're somebody who's going to be in, you have a loan out and you're being engaged as an employee, let's just say through the payroll company, and you get hurt, that's probably going to end up being a battle of the insurance companies about who's going to be primary, who's going to be secondary, and but it's going to be for them to figure out. I mean, for you as an individual, you're going to want it to be that payroll company's insurance policy first so that your premiums don't go up. Um, but I think that's something that ultimately they're going to have to kind of hash out. There isn't going to be. Um, typ typically, that would be something that's engaged by the production company. The network's not going to be the one who's engaging your pyrotechnic specialist or, or anything like that. And they, the network's very happy to say, okay, production company, that's your problem to deal with. And by the way, don't forget, you guys rep and warranted and are indemnifying us against anything bad happening, so it's on you. Don't screw it up. So they really, and they want to hide behind that indemnity as much as possible. So the more hands off they are, the better it is. The more they're involved, the more that kind of muddies that water. You definitely want to outsource that risk as, as much, much as, as you can. And outsourcing it to an individual, if they've got insurance to back that up, that's great. But you're better to outsource it to a company which has um, a level of insurance that can um, have slightly deeper pockets. Um, and, and what that does is that, you know, as the production company, you want to protect the network. You don't want, you know, they, they're the biggest fish in the room. You don't want a claim to pass through you and go to the network because you're never going to get business again. Um, so what you want to do is make sure that you've got a, if you're bringing in a um, safety expert, a pyro expert, stunt expert, that they're attached to a company that has a, a very good insurance policy around it and you make sure you firewall uh, that. Because um, the moment you bring in an individual, you know, the, any claim is going to pass through that individual so quickly um, uh, that, you know, it's going to end up on doesn't matter how many contracts you have, if they haven't got the ability to pay, um, it's, uh, it's on you. So cho choose your company really well and get that paperwork lined up. That, that's what I'd, I'd advise. That also goes to when you're hiring fixers and foreign facilitators. For you're looking at that arm's distance mm -hmm. and you're also looking at being in a foreign country and the people that are being hired there, whether they're the experts or even just the local drivers, PAs, whatever it is, you want those running through that foreign facilitator and you want to make sure that your contract with that foreign facilitator dictates all of the things that Kate was talking about as far as making sure that they have the insurance that you require even if they're they have insurance, you want to make sure that it's a level that you're comfortable with, and if not, they got to go get it, or you're not going to hire them. And what you want to do is making sure that they have all of those things in place having to do with property, having to do with workers' comp, or whatever the social scheme is in that country, because everybody's different, as, as we know, um, because you're keeping that arm's distance they're doing the hiring, and this goes to contractual. Um, insurance follows the contract. And that's a big thing, because what's in that contract is going to say what your insurance is going to respond to. So you want to make sure that you have in your contract all of those things that say that that, that vendor or foreign facilitator, they're going to be the first line of defense. And then it's going to come back and you're protecting not only your production company, but you're also protecting the network or the studio or whoever it is that you're dealing with. So when you're fi hiring foreign, there's a whole different world that has to be addressed there that you need to pay attention to because it's not the same. 
in the United States when you're doing the vendors and things like that. You can do all of these things. You want to do some of those same things and, and then some when you're hiring foreign. It's a, it's a little different. Um, I wanted to get into the, the contractual stuff and some of the terminology that you were using and, and explain just, what some of those things are. I was just going to say we should are. explain uh, so should indemnity. A bit. Indemnity, <laughs> indemnity, reps and warranties, things that are in a yeah. kind of, what, is, what do those mean? I could start with indemnity and then Deal. you can okay, go into reps and warranties. <laughs> um, so let's see if I can explain indemnification simply. Um, essentially, it's a provision that says if you, as a producer, are getting sued, by some third party for something that someone else did, right? Then they have to reimburse you for those costs of whatever that um, lawsuit or whatever expenses you incurred by getting sued from that third party because it was their wrongdoing. I don't know if that, if that made sense, but think of it as they're standing behind their word. Mm -hmm. If I tell you, you can use this piece of music and you use it, and then you get sued because I didn't really have the right to give it to you, I'm going to stand behind that, and I'm going to pay your losses. That's what an indemnity essentially does. Um, and it ties into the reps and warranties because this is mm -hmm. when somebody is saying, this is what I'm telling you I am. Um, I'm representing to you that I know what I'm doing. I am warranting, I am promising that I have the ability to do this and that when you use it, you're not going to be sued. And so these two provisions really work together. So if you have somebody saying, I don't want to indemnify you for my for what I'm giving you, that should be a really big red flag. Why won't they stand behind their promises? Um, a great example, you see this a lot uh, in music licenses or uh, cl or footage off of the internet where they go, you can use it, but we're not telling you we have the right to let you use it. That's a big flag. You should be going, that's way too risky. You know, you want somebody who's going to say, I own this photograph and here you may use it. I'm giving you the right to use it. And if anyone else comes out, don't worry, I'm standing behind this because I have that right. So th those are provisions that I can say are very important to, to us. Um, and I think they're very important ultimately to our production teams, even if they don't always know it right away, because this is our way of making sure that we have people who really know what they're doing and they're standing behind that work, which makes a difference, especially if you're getting a claim, because you want to be, again, in terms of protecting the production company, protecting the network, you want to be able to say, look, this is the person that gave it and this is, they're, they, they're standing behind it. But again, back to Julian's point, there's a, an indemnity becomes worth the paper it's printed on, especially as like the production company. I can get you know, talent to tell me that I have the right to use whatever they give me, they probably don't have that much money by and large. So if there's a lawsuit, they're not going to be able to cover the costs. I'm going to cover the costs. Also, the person's probably not going to sue the talent or um, the independent contractor who gave you whatever. They're going to come after me or the network because we've got deeper pockets. So that also becomes a factor for us, you know, who, who's going to be carrying that load. And that's just also why you want to expand the reps and warranties to the furthest extent possible. So a lot of times uh, what I've seen is, okay, so the indemnity is covering you for a breach of reps and warranties. Okay, so Among let me things. see what the reps and warranties are. And it will say something to the effect of, you know, my loan out is, is an existing entity, period. L <laughs> <Right>? licensed, <laughs> licensed to do business licensed in the state of business. California. And that's the only rep and warranty. Well, that's not very helpful to you, uh, you know, in terms of that indemnity provision. So you're going to get pushback when you're, if, you, if you try and do the reps and warranties <laughs> that Stephanie suggested that are extremely expansive. But that's where you want to go because the more that they rep and warrant to you, the more protection you're going to have under that indemnity provision. And even if it doesn't work, that's one of many it's of the different products. Yeah, it's exactly. It's one of the shields that um, you're putting in place for yourself. And, you know, building off of that, if somebody starts pushing back on those representations and warranties, that's when I'm getting on the phone with somebody. And I want to understand what their concern specifically is. Why, why are you worried about telling me that you own everything you're giving me? Is it that you might be using some stuff in public domain? Okay, that's easy to fix. But if it's, well, I don't really own everything, well, now at least we know. So I, again, I have so many more things I can do when I know. 
and it's before we've used it because maybe it's like, okay, then we don't need to be contracting with this person. We need to go talk to this person over here who actually has the rights. Let's, let's talk to the right person. Let's pay the right person. Um, and it, this just sort of all flushes out. At the same time, our indemnities, I feel, tied very much into insurance because there are certain things that our insurance company will require we have an indemnification for. Uh, certain types of services could be um, also our assumption of risk will come into play where, uh, which is another provision often in our crew and talent contracts where especially if you're doing something dangerous, you're assuming that you know it's possible to get hurt. Uh, kind of one of those nice titles that tells you exactly what it means. Um, but our insurance company is going to say, if you are using a music company to source music for your show and they won't indemnify you for the use of that music, we won't insure. Because again, this is a big company. Why aren't they standing behind their product? And I think that really, to me, if you're in the field and you're dealing with somebody who's going, hey, I don't want to indemnify you for my work, that should be your red flag to, again, to call, whether it's your EIC, if you feel comfortable calling your production attorney, give us a call and say, hey, this is going on and that's a red flag. Why won't they stand behind their work? And again, we can kind of dig in and figure out if there's like a reasonable modification that we can make to the contract so that everybody's comfortable. But if we have somebody who's just like, hey, not my problem, you're, you're engaging me and you live with the results and proceeds and if you get sued, that's on you. Now that's a conversation I think we have to have about, do we want to use that person? Who else can we engage? This is, okay. I'll say one more thing, that this is also something that, um, kind of like I was talking about in the beginning, that we work on a lot of projects that don't already have a destination. Um, and then, you know, they find somebody later and, and you're moving towards delivery. And this is one of the provisions that absolutely has to be in every contract, like no matter what. There's a couple provisions that distributors and studios networks will look at to make sure it's there and they're going to require that you go back if, if it's not there. So indemnification is one of those. Just on the... Um we obviously deal with a lot of international contracts and um, to the point of, um, you know, the indemnification and all these other elements. And obviously you want to be able to be ticking the boxes for where you're doing business. Um, one of the things which we would absolutely encourage all contracts to have is wording around FCP, Foreign Corrupt Practices, yeah. also the UK Bribery Act, um, making sure that you've got the integrity requirements of the studio, or the network, um, that you're working with. So what you're doing is not only dealing with the granular, but dealing with the entire context of how you're doing that piece of business. So if you're going into a place like Ukraine or Hungary or wherever it might be, you want to be able to say, yes, we've got all these requirements which can go all the way back through to your needs for a studio, but you want to be replacing it within the context of international law and also in the context of the jurisdiction that you're in because you don't want to get into the point where they say, hey, common practices, yeah, sure, we'll sign that, but it doesn't really line up in that jurisdiction. It doesn't matter if it's under New York law and you're doing it somewhere else. I mean, at the end of the day, to be able to extract someone out of um, the Ukraine and put them in court in New York um, or under that law is going to, be, you know, the, the, the test of it is the lawyers are happy, the studio's happy, but at the end of the day, there's no remedy. Um, and you're also going to make sure that you're really protected against the larger um, international laws. And so really make sure that you, you put that in context to protect yourself and anyone that you're hiring or anyone that you're using. So I'm sure you know where that still are having foreign corrupt practices going on, obviously. Well, I mean, if, if CP and the UK Bribery Act, I mean, were put, largely put in for larger geopolitical reasons than production. Um, but um, I would absolutely um, be certain that if you're doing any business in Russia or uh, any, any country which is like that, with this huge opportunity to do business, um, that you've got those things well and truly in place. Because, uh, I mean, for instance, um, uh, a studio exec was um, held up entering into uh, Russia um, in recent history. Um, and that actually had an impact on the entire studio. And the, the crux of that was actually based back to geopolitical issues. So, you know, you trying to do business in another country may be influenced by um, geopolitical relationships between, you know, nation states. 
It's exactly the same with the, the Sony hack, um, which took place, which, you know, whatever the, whatever really took place there, there was enough fear that uh, doing business in certain parts of the world may actually have an impact back to the studio, which may be well beyond, you know, anyone's pay grade in this room. Um, but it does actually have an impact on your freedom to do business. And that's usually something that on the studio side will will be weighing in the risk assessment yeah. at that early stage, you know, and that might be one of the creative decisions is, that we have to kind of work out, okay, we really wanted to film in Russia, but based on current geopolitical situations, we don't feel comfortable with that. What is another good similarly looking location? You know, can we go to Romania inst instead and still get a very similar feel, but maybe we feel more comfortable with that level of risk. Yeah, or, or um, contract it as a negative pickup. You know, put it straight onto the production company. There's no relationship with um, the production company in the studio. And for that, to come, you know, like yeah, there's we'll, ways... Yeah. We'll, we'll do that sometimes with facilitators if yeah. we're in that kind of, in that country where it's like the facilitator's contract will have the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act language, it's going to have the UK bribery law language, and then it's, you, you just sort of hope that the facilitator doesn't put something like bribes in a line item. <laughs> you and think they we've won't. seen it. See? <laughs> Couldn't comment. <laughs> I plead the fifth. Look, look, at the end of the day, there's, every country has a different way of doing business. You know, our, um, our parking ticket in California might be um, someone else's bribe somewhere else. I mean, you, you, there's, there's no one, you, you can't take US law and place it into every other country. You can take US law and say, this is how I'm going to do business in that other country. But um, without a doubt, there's facilitation payments, location agreements, um, management fees. I mean, there's all sorts of euphemisms around it um, that will take place. And sometimes it's, um, uh, you need to make a call about whether you actually feel comfortable with this or not. And uh, you know, we've walked away from many projects uh, or many incidents where we look at it and just go, Look, this is this doesn't smell right. We're not doing it, and we'll go a different way. And sometimes it means that we can't do something, so we can't do it. But you should never get yourself into a position where you're so cornered that you actually have to pay a bribe, because um, there's no coming back from that once it's done. It's transacted. Yeah. Part of your risk assessment is that country and the facilitators that are in. There. Well, we we have a corruption index which we um, monitor about a dozen different. Um, Areas so we know. I mean, look, if you're going into business and uh, and doing something in um, the DRC and um, Democratic Republic of Congo, you know the, the the facilitation to get things done there is completely cash economy. Um, but if you're going into Sweden, um, it's a different type of you know it's a different type of business. But you're absolutely right. That's part of the risk assessment, and that's what I was saying at the beginning. You know, you may be very comfortable to lean into this, lean into that risk. If that's what you want to do, understand what the framework is and, and talk with the insurer and talk with the legal team and talk with your financier and, and also what you feel comfortable with and say, look, we are going into northern Iraq, corruption level, you know, red, um, but this is where the story is. And we understand that this is the framework. And um, instead of burying your head in the sand and saying, you know, yes, of course, we'll, everything will be above board, you go into it saying, well, this is the landscape and this is the way that we're going to do business here. And um, I mean, we don't, we, we don't encourage it either way. Our job as a risk assessment business is to sit there and say, this is what we think the truth is. This is the truth test on the landscape. Now go and get expert advice on where you feel uncomfortable. All right. And that's where I can come in to say, here's what the cost would be to go and do that from an insurance standpoint. So. You know, if you want to go into Russia, right, it's possible to do that. There, you can get an insurance policy for, it's really called a political risk insurance. So if you show up there and they just all of a sudden take all of your camera equipment, they confiscate it, or they don't allow you permission into the country, and now all of a sudden you're out hundreds of thousands of dollars because you can't film per your, you know, planned schedule, that political risk coverage can trigger. So, again, it's all about having open dialogue and discussions there. And, you know, I just want to go back for, for a moment. To Mary Pat's comment that the contract is certainly key because if and when a claim does come down, the insurance company is going to look at that contract and they're going to be analyzing exactly what you've agreed to 
um, give back to the party you've contracted with. So without that, you know, and I think the segues and some people will talk about a little bit later, even if you're holding a certificate of insurance, if the contract doesn't point back to that, doesn't point back to the insurance, that certificate's just a piece of paper, really. It, it just shows that you ha that they have insurance, but it doesn't. If they don't give it to you in the contract, time, come time to claim, you know, you're gonna. It's gonna be your out-of-pocket expense. So, I think this is a good time. We're gonna take a 10-minute break. So everybody's eyes that are rolling back in the back of your heads, you can refresh and come back. We're gonna get into a little bit more of the the details and the documents and things like that, and get into a little more of that after go through some of this just so that you have idea of what we're talking about and then we'll get into some of the documents um, that you're most commonly going to, as being out in the field doing things just things you need to be aware of and documents you might need to fill out or that insurers want you to fill out um, or require you to fill out so um, I want to get in stick with the legal for a minute we talked about indemnification let's just go take that the next step of mutual indemnification and let's talk about waiver of subrogation and let's get into the, all those kinds of things and then get into all of the the official insurance terms <laughs> and start with mutual in indemnification uh, again and this is just turning it around right and so before the break we were talking about how you really want to um, look at the reps and warranties of the person that you're getting into a contract with, but this is you want to see what you're rep and warranting, right? Because this is now um, putting you on the hook. Uh, and so it, in some ways it's the opposite, right? So you want to try and limit what you're rep and warranting in the contract. Um, but, but that's really what mutual indemnification is. And um, I think the thing that we see the most Right, is that the language is different, um, you know, for, uh, for for both sides. So um, while it is important to see the indemnity, indemnity language for the other side, um, you really want to work with your lawyer to to figure out um, to, to do the best you can to limit the indemnity that you are offering on your side. Um, and just to kind of expand on that a little bit, you know. Again, when you look at it from the perspective of standing behind what you're doing, what they're, the way I look at it is my crew member, my talent, whomever it is, is saying, okay, production company, tell us that you're not going to breach the agreement. And in, to Keith's point, how it often differs is you're not going to exploit this program in a way that could potentially cause me liability. So from a conceptual matter, I don't really have a problem with a mutual indemnity. In fact, that's usually one of the tools in my tool belt I will use to kind of get an indemnity through on the other side is, hey, look, I'll step up to the line too. It's not, I'm not just asking you. And there are parts that are gonna mirror. So it's gonna say, it, it, you know, we agree, uh, you know, I'm going to indemnify, defend, and hold you harmless, so you're gonna indemnify, defend, and hold me harmless. You wanna pull up defend? Guess what, then I'm not defending you either. It's gotta be balanced. But the specific things, like Kate said, we can all indemnify each other that we won't breach the agreement, but there are certain things that you do as the talent or you do as the crew that is different than what I have to do. So they can't look identical, but we're gonna keep, I would say, the basics to mirror each other as much as possible. Yes, that there there is that 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 aspect depending on what is ultimately the breach, um, but again, I I usually have enough confidence in my whether it's I've been on the network side or the production company side that you know we're we're not going to breach our agreement. You know we're not going to. Um, you know, do something with the show that we're we're not supposed to. It doesn't mean it's a hundred percent, but it. I have enough confidence that it's not going to be, you know, a make or break thing for for my client. Um, and chances are, if we're if the, if someone's feeling like we've breached an agreement, there might be more at play than just you know a rep and warranty at that point. One more thing I'll say about that provision is sometimes there'll be settlement language in there, and I, I guess you know, you're, 
your attorney will be looking at that in more detail, but it's just something to make sure you're not glancing over either. Uh, well, one thing I've, I'll see, and honestly for me this is a non-starter because of my insurance, is when it says, oh, you can't settle this without my approval, and you know, this may be talent, maybe a non-writing EP, maybe, you know, whomever, the answer is no. Yeah. Um, especially where I'm the production company, chances are it's not even going to be my insurance that will drive it. Ultimately, it's going to be my network's insurance. So if the network wants to settle, guess what? They've got the deepest pockets. They're on the hook the most. They're going to decide, like, even if that doesn't get you as the contributor off the hook. So there are things like that we're going to have to talk through. But again, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, as being the 400-pound gorilla in the room, that means I'm going to get to dictate some things that you're not going to. But part of that is understand I'm turning around and I'm working with a CBS. They're the 800 pound gorilla and they're dictating stuff to me too. So we're, we're all kind of getting it from some, somewhere. So that, that really depends on what company you, you're looking at and their pros and cons to both. Uh, the reason some companies prefer arbitration to litigation is it's a confidential proceeding, so there's less in the public record. Um, there's a myth that that takes less time. In practice, arbitration and litigation can be about the same, especially because most arbitration is governed by the same litigation discovery practices as a standard litigation. Also, um, in my experience, even if something first goes through arbitration, it doesn't mean that those arbitrations were kept as confidential as you would have liked. Uh, again, from a studio network side, one reason to go arbitration over litigation is the fact that I can require that this is an arbitrator who's familiar with the entertainment industry, because sometimes we'll be working through concepts that are so unique, whether it's copyright or um, you know, intellectual property of some other, that if I'm just with a, a judge in the district court, they may or may not have that background. So those just become certain factors for us to, you know, it's a conversation really with the production company or the network, depending on where you are, to say what, what is in our best interest. Um, one of the flip sides for litigation, especially if you're the big company, is you've got deeper pockets. You have a huge war chest. You know, we can bury the other side in discovery. And that, that becomes, you know, you want to take us on. Hey, look, I have in-house litigation. I can just kick this over to them. I'm out. You're going to have to go buy, hire a, an attorney. Maybe they'll do it on contingency. Maybe it's an hourly rate. And you know, you're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars. And although my company's spending resources, we had to pay those people's salary anyway. So it, it really is kind of uh, depends on the client, what, their, what, what they feel the cost benefits are for going either way. Um, and it's, I, I would put it as a personal choice. Well, I mean, I would say that indemnity and insurance, they certainly play in the same space together, but they're totally distinct in that and the indemnity is a legal recourse, and it has nothing to do necessarily with insurance. If in the event of a claim, the insurance is going to look to the contract, they're going to look to the indemnities, the reps and warranties, et cetera, but it's not going to really dictate. The insurance policy has its own sets of terms and conditions. That's really going to dictate how a claim is going to be paid or, 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 or whatnot. So. Um, and that, that goes back to, to what we said, that, that, that insurance follows the contract. So it's, it's not the insurance, as, as Toby said, it's not the insurance that's dictating, it's the contract that's dictating. But that contract will dictate what the cost of policies are. Right, and it'll also, it'll also dictate what insurance is, is going to respond to. Yeah, in each contract there'll, there'll be an insurance provision that's outlining what each party is agreeing to extend to one another. And that's usually something that I'll, when, especially if I'm contracting with um, a network, for example, and they come to me and they say, okay, here are the insurance requirements we're asking of you. First thing I do is I go to my EIC and I go, okay, here's the insurance provision. Tell me that we have this. And if we don't, let's get this in place before we enter into this contract. Mm -hmm. And then once we have those insurance requirements, that's one of the things that you know, the EICs will make sure is in the contracts with all the other people because we know what our general liability limits are. And again, it could affect when you go into a location. You know, they want to be added as an additional insured under your policy. Is that something we can agree to? You know, these all become aspects and again, 
you might be looking at it affecting your premiums um, depending on what you're agreeing to, but it may also be in your best interest to do that because maybe a higher premium is still going to be less in the long run than if somebody gets hurt and now you have to deal with a lawsuit or an arbitration. Let's get into some of the, the terminology and, and start with the difference between being named insured or being additionally insured sure. and what that means. <laughs> I mean, so for lack of a better word, named insured is essentially that you are the, the entity that took out the policy. You have control of that policy, right? Your name is on the policy, right? That's, that's named insured. Additional insured is something that's not necessarily contemplated when the policy is put into to effect but it might be something that you're wanting to extend an insurance relationship to a party, i.e. a camera equipment rental company uh, location, right? Because as part of that contract, they're wanting to see that you have certain insurance limits because they don't want to take on your exposure for what you're doing within the confines of that studio space or wherever, whatever you're doing. They want to make sure that you're bringing your own insurance to the table for what you're doing. So they ask for additional insured status, which is extending your policy, you're the named insured, the production company is the named insured in this scenario, you're extending additional insured status to that location or that camera rental company. So. And that, that also, we do that with regard to foreign facilitators. So for race, we don't have a worldwide liability policy and we're also not going into contractual relationships with anybody foreign other than the facilitator. So we're going to ask them to A, have the insurance policy that meets our requirements, but we also want to be additionally insured on that policy because they're the ones who are doing the contractual in-country um, contracts and hiring and all of that sort of thing. And we want to make sure that we're protected under that policy for whatever they're doing. And so that's where we end up. But there is, there is always confusion between named insured and additionally insured. Um, and, and in foreign countries, sometimes you can't be additionally insured. You have to either be named on the policy or you can't be on the policy at all. Some foreign countries do that. So these are things that you have to check when you're going into different places as to what's happening and how you can go about doing that um, to make sure that you're, you're protected. And we do that so that we're protected and that our network is protected. Um, so that's protecting us from the facilitator's potential negligence in that situation. Yep. That, did I get that right? Yeah, I mean, that, that's the key thing of additional insured. It, it allows that additional insured party to have recourse under the policy, for, to, be, to be defended under the policy for claims, right? which is why they want to see that additional insured status. They want to be protected under your policy. They want your policy to be the one that takes the hit first. They don't, you know, even though they may have their own policy, they want you to respond first because you're coming into their location, you're renting their camera, you're doing whatever, Right, so if a claim happens as a result of what you've done, they want to be protected first and not have that claim experience go to their own insurance policy. Yeah. And real quick about the loan out we were talking about before and things like that, that it is very standard that you'd see, um, maybe not as much for unscripted, but you know, with just performers, with crew, with everybody, it is an expectation that they would be added as additional insured, both their loan out company, if there is one, and also them as an individual. Um, I mean, I, I can say that uh, talent, even if it's unscripted versus scripted, it, it's not uncommon for, to be asked to be added to both the E&O policy and general mm -hmm. liability policies. And it's not something that, you know, I, I would say you should fight over. It's not a big deal to just add them. Yeah. Um, yeah, just, it's, it's common. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's totally doable. So if you're going to fight on something, that's, that's not the thing to yeah, fight don't, on. Don't die on that sword. There's question, question. Judy's question back there. If you're an additional insured, you have recourse under the policy. You can make a claim under the policy. Even if the named insured were to go bankrupt, as long as that policy is still in force, 
right, then that entitles you to make a claim against the policy, right? And as an additional insured, you also are entitled to receive notification benefits. If that policy were to be canceled, there's an obligation to notify the additional insured that the policy is canceled so that you would know that you're now exposed and don't have coverage by what was intended in the contract or by that party, right? So what I would say, though, is that insurance companies have a ton of additional insureds being extended, right? I mean, there's policies that have blanket additional insured status. To manage that, if there were to be a cancellation, for them to go and notify all the additional insureds, I think is, is an overwhelming prospect. So what we would recommend doing is that if you can have that notification obligation go back to the contracting party and have them be responsible to say, hey, you know what, I'm declaring for bankruptcy, my policy is now being canceled, I want to make you aware as per what we've agreed to in the contract, have it done that way. It's a much more direct route to go as opposed to having a, an insurance company who may not really know you at all be the one to come and try to tell you or find you. Yeah, okay. You had a question? Sure. Do you guys have trouble with any foreign general liability? Well, it, it's layers of insurance. We have insurance. CBS has insurance. But the CBS policy for our show does not extend worldwide. So what we're doing, and that's liability. Okay, we do have a worldwide property policy, um, but it's, it's the, lia the GL policy is not a worldwide policy. So we actually either have to put insurance in place in some countries, um, just because of the nature of the way the countries are, or our foreign facilitators are doing it because we're not going into contractual relationship in those countries. And that goes back again to the contract. Our contract is with the facilitator they're providing us with their insurance. They're providing us with additional insured status or depending on the location, named insured as required by their local foreign laws. But we're not hiring anybody. We're not doing any of that. The facilitator is. So you want to make sure that they're having that insurance. Our insurance that we have will defend us. It'll take care of that. And, and if we do something, we're covered. That's that's workers' comp. That's a that's a different thing. No, it's a well. They may on because of the nature of the show, we fall into all sorts of different areas, and and because we're also considered part of CBS, CBS's insurance is massive. Um, yeah. So that's not something that that we're as concerned about, but our way of protecting us as a production company and then having that arm's distance with the network is by having the facilitators put their insurance in place to our guidelines. So they have to meet our requirements. And even if the statutory limits, which is the required amount in some foreign country, says you only have to have $100,000 worth of liability insurance, that doesn't fly. They've got to meet our minimum requirements to have that so that we have that protection. And that facilitator has the protection because they're doing all of that contractual hiring. They're hiring the staff. They're making the location agreements. They're doing all of that. We're not. So that, again, goes back to whose who's contract, who's doing it. And that then having them having that insurance and us added on to that policy protects us. Well, could, if I could address your, so the likelihood is that CBS or a studio already has like an annual overarching certificate with uh, entertainment partners, media services, et cetera. So that's probably why a specific project isn't getting asked for it. But when you're seeing it, that is a legitimate request that, you, that they do ask for. And just briefly, the reasoning for it is that it goes into that independent contractor scenario, right? So if for whatever reason somebody is being hired and, you know, they fell into independent contractor and they don't have work comp recourse, right? So media services want to say, well, we're, we're covering everybody you're saying as an employee. We have them from a work comp perspective, but your ICs, if they have a claim, that goes to general liability. They have to sue you for bodily injury under general liability because they're not an employee. They don't have workers comp rights. They don't have employer's liability stuff. So 
that's why they want to see your general liability policy because it exposes a different avenue of legal recourse for somebody. So it's it's totally totally common. Now you had a question about gap. Well, who's the production company? Is it CBS? No. No. No, it's World Race Productions. Right. So don't they want to have any sort of coverage? We're under CBS. Yeah. Yeah. We. That, and that was set up when the company was set up and when the, the project was set up. Um, because that company is is solely for the amazing race. It doesn't produce anything else. That's all it produces. So it's it's by nature of the way it was set up, it was set up under the under CBS. Yeah. Yes. Um, just to clarify the question, um you use the term local criteria facilitator of a, a, a facilitator production service company in a foreign country is often referred to as a fixer um, sometimes they're companies sometimes they're a guy <laughs> or a woman <laughs> and then they set something up at that time but most of the time it's it's smaller companies or sometimes larger companies but but fixer facilitator often get used interchangeably fixer can also be more like a location like doing locations and doing permits and things like that, but not, might not be doing hiring. Um, that's that's usually when you get more into a facilitator uh, reference in that sense. Um, let's get into all of the different terms. Um, I think there's some question about uh, getting into the difference between employer's liability and workers' comp and you know getting into liability gl is that the same as third party liability is in go through all of the little individual terms oh sure so if you have the hand on if not i can just kind of speak to it if primary non-contributory so briefly what that is is that again when you're in a contractual situation where somebody's asking you to extend insurance because they want to be protected uh, if they're smart or oftentimes they will ask for your policy to be the primary responding party primary responding policy and that would not that would be the only policy that would contribute in the event of a claim because again that location owner doesn't want their insurance to kick in for something that you did that caused a claim right so they'll ask for primary primary non-contributory language um, waiver of subrogation is another common clause and what that is essentially saying is that Whoever's agreeing in the contract is saying that their insurance company will waive their right to subrogate against the other party. So again, in the context of that location owner saying, I, I want you to give me a waiver of subrogation, right? So if there's a claim, again, it's all going to be on your policy. And even if your insurance company pays out, when, they wa when you waive rights of subrogation, it prevents your insurance company from them going back to that location and saying, well, you know what? Yeah, there was a claim, and we paid it under your production company policy, but really it's because you, Mr. Location Owner, had negligence in the fact that you forgot to um, fix that step that caused that person to fall over, right? So that waiver segregation prevents your insurance company from going back and recovering behind the scenes for any sort of payment that was paid out there. And real quick before you move on, that is something that you'll see in the in contracts too, right? So it's something to look out for to see if that language is put in there. Um, and um, but yes, yeah, that's also something that I I notice can get glanced over, but it has an effect on the insurance policy. And the and to that point, you know, it's not an automatic no that you can't agree to a waiver of separation, but it is a conversation because you know you need to talk with your EICs or with or we need to talk directly with the insurance company to find out, hey, what's it going to be as a cost to me to agree to, for you to waive your subrogation rights? Because you're now really putting the shifting some of the risk onto your insurance company to say, hey, if something happens, you can't get reimbursed even if it's not our fault. So it has to be a conversation. Uh, you don't want to spring that on them. They, they're never happy to see that yeah. surprise. Yeah, if you can get away with not having waiver subrogation, uh, it would be preferred to do it because um, there there can be a cost for adding it on because your insurance company is saying, well, now I'm prevented to go and try to recover behind the scenes. So as a result, I want to charge up front some kind of fixed yeah. fee to say, I mean, it could be $250, $500, but still, it's, just be aware that if you're asking them to do that, there can be a cost of doing it. And that's something that, you know, we'll weigh in terms of how much do we need that location. 
Like right. if, if it's something that you know we absolutely have to be at, again, it's a chance for us to at least talk with our insurance company, say, hey, we have to agree to this. What is the cost going to be to us? And if it's five hundred dollars, you know, when you're looking at a budget, you can usually find five hundred bucks somewhere. Um, you know, there is a point where anything can become cost prohibitive, but. Uh, again, it's just something you want to be aware of and talking about so that it's not later down the line that it's, oh, whoops, we agreed to this and nobody knew about it. You'll also see that a lot of times um, having to do with aircraft and chartering planes or chartering helicopters, your insurance company will, and your contract, is going to require that company to provide you with a waiver of subrogation. And that's yeah. that's something that you just you just ask for it because you want that. You absolutely want that. That's probably the, one of the most important times where you would want a waiver of subrogation for your production company. You do not want to be held responsible for a $200 million aircraft hull, right, if something were to happen, right? If that Boeing or whatever it's going to be, right, gets physically damaged just because it so happens to be while you're filming or using it, that's a, that's a huge liability back, back to you. So if you're dealing with you need the owner of the property to uh, actually give you the right because while the tenant can give you the legal authority to enter onto the premise the rights of being able to record duplicate and exhibit uh, actually lives with the landlord so, so the phrase just gives pardon Yes, yes, if they've given it to the tenant, that's different, but most leases do not, you'd have to actually look at the lease to see if it, they have it. Even though we've got the signature from the tenant, that doesn't... Not necessarily, not necessarily. We, I, I've, I've had situations where we will have both the tenant and the landlord sign. Um, as Jason was saying, if the, if the person's lease actually give, the landlord gave the tenant that right, and you, you know, under those circumstances, I wouldn't take the tenant's word for it. I'd say, hey, I need a copy of your lease to show my, my business affairs. I'll look through the lease and see if they really did have that right. Most leases, although you can, you know, invite people onto the property, that doesn't give you the rights to film. Um, so we'd have to make sure that the tenant had the right. If they did, then yeah, you can rely on the tenant. Um, if they didn't, you know, you really need the landlord. So if you're going to pay a location fee, make sure you're paying the right person. Mm -hmm. we, we've had situations before where I, I had people pay tenants, and then it turned out they didn't have those rates, and now we had to get the landlord, and we had to pay them too. So that was... Are most standard leases you know, Traditionally not, okay. but it has happened from time to time. So what coverage do you have if they wrap and warrant if they do have the right? It's as good as the paper it's written on. We no, we haven't. <laughs> Isn't it great that the answer still doesn't change? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so let's get into what, what is liability? What is third-party liability? Are they the same thing? Uh, they, they share something uh, together, yeah. I mean, so you could have... Uh, Third party, yes, liability really extends to a third party making a claim against you, right? So that your general liability policy is there to cover something that, where a third party is making a claim because they were hurt as a result of something that you were doing, right? They slip and fall over a, uh, over a microphone cable or, right, you're digging a trench to go and do something for the production and they fall in the trench because there weren't enough, you know, it wasn't blocked off accordingly. That's a third party claim coming back to you, right? It's not. It's not a first party coverage because if it's anybody that's like your talent or your crew and they slip and fall or whatever and get hurt, that really should be going back to a worker's comp. So liability is really a third party claim situation. Okay. Um, let's go into just gener just covering the basics of property and, and employers liability versus worker's comp. So work, workers' comp is, the, is a set state benefit scheme, right, where uh, each state dictates what is, you know, can, can be paid out based upon the, the duration of the loss, the type of loss, et cetera, right? And that's, that's really like a no-fault type of scenario, right? You're at your desk and now you're having carpal tunnel or you just happen to be, right, we're all 
prone to just falling down, and you do it, and it has nothing to do with, it's just like you just fell down, right? But you got hurt during the course of work, and you can make a claim for workers comp. It's just no, no questions asked. You certainly have to support the industry, in, in, injury, but that policy is there to pay out a set benefit as per each, each state has its own variation of it, but that's what workers comp is doing. Employer's liability is there actually has to be culpability and fault by the employer based upon something they've asked you to do, right? So if, if your employer was asking you to just manually lift up 500 pounds of boxes, <laughs> they have negligence there because it's not humanly possible really to do that without expecting there to be some kind of injury, right? Or they have fault because, again, you're digging a trench for production and um, they ask you to do it, but it's not roped off accordingly and all of a sudden you're hurt and the worker's comp isn't sufficient, you can then come back and look to employer's liability to sue for above and beyond, you know, for severity of damages. But it really has to be the employer, you have, has to have, there has to be fault found with what the employer did from a negligence standpoint. What are, what would be considered normal basic insurance limits? A million dollars from a liability standpoint is like basic, basic. I wouldn't say anything less than that. Even if you're working on a, on a, on a sizzle or something that's a $25,000 project, a million dollars. And that's, I, I, as a broker, I would much go for much higher, but I know that there's, you know, you're weighing pros and cons of costs, right? But just from a pure baseline perspective, a million dollars is, I think, what any typical vendor, mom and pop shop is going to ask they're going to want to see. It's just kind of ingrained within our culture. They want to see seven figures there, right? That's, that's, that's typically mm -hmm. enough. But when you get into dealing with studios and networks, et cetera, that number becomes five, ten plus million dollars. So. And, I, and with regard to foreign countries, again, the foreign countries have different sort of standard high limits um, and in some places you actually can't get a million dollars um, but at that point then you're going to want to get whatever the highest limit is that you can actually get in that country and those are the questions that you have to ask um, when you're filming overseas um, obviously a million dollars certainly is what you want as your minimum from your as as Toby said but you also need to know what is available. A lot of times your foreign insurance broker is the one who is going to be able to tell you, even though somebody in some country may say, well, I can only get 500,000. Your foreign insurance broker is gonna be able to tell you whether that's true or not. Because sometimes that may be what they can get or what they can afford to get for their company. But if you're coming in and saying you want a million and your foreign broker says, yeah, you can buy it, you can get it, then that's when you get into the negotiation with them of you are able to buy that insurance in that country. It might not be with the broker or the insurance company that they have, but it's available. And if you want, and if you're trying to meet what your network or your studio is requiring, then that's what you have to do. And sometimes you have to pay for it because sometimes those companies can't afford that. So it ends up being part of your contract and that goes back to the contract language of saying something within the contract that if that facilitator is unable to provide it, that you have the right to go and get that insurance yourself or somehow have it in the contract that you can pay for that insurance to be able to provide that insurance. Can, can I just add to that? Um, uh, when you're getting the foreign insurance, also make sure you understand which currency it's in. Yes. And also um, uh, what the US dollar is doing as well. There's been a four to five percent shift in the FX in the last three months between the Euro and the US. Mm -hmm. So on the million dollar policy, five percent is actually um, quite a material amount of money. So um, just be constantly weighing all those things up. Well, and that's, and that's something that, that I deal with on a regular basis. And so when I say I want a million US, I don't care what their currency is doing. They've got to use, buy enough insurance to make sure that I always have a million dollars minimum. So that might mean that they have to buy a million five US 
in order to take that fluctuation into account. So those are the, the currency things. It's, it's a big deal. It's a, yeah. it's a big and player. And that's, that's typically the approach, to just to kind of inflate the limit to offset any variation in currency, right? Because depending if you're doing a short-term production, that tends to work. But you can't. It is possible to get an insurance company to agree to a static limit regardless of currency fluctuations. So if you are in a buy and you have a really have a long-term exposure that's subject to a lot more fluctuations, you can get that negotiated into that insurance policy. Yeah. Don't you see that as a line item though, uh, insurance cost? It will, it will go in, it'll go into to their foreign budget, but it'll, right. it, it ends up hitting my budget, yes. Right, it's both, but I'm saying, yeah. okay, I've never seen one item without insurance costs. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, it'll go in there. Okay. Absolutely. And I would, I would just add too that, you know, if you are in a foreign scenario where the local fixer or facilitator is they're not getting what you're needing from to meet your network or studio requirement and they say hey 500,000 is the most I can get you can go back to your foreign broker out of the US here and they're typically the solution where they can get uh, their network you know whoever your foreign carriers to then go and do us another policy here right it's a US company but they're facilitating something locally to get that local limit up just you know, I don't get into too many details but if you run into stumbling blocks within the local foreign facilitator, you can come back to the U.S. market and there's a solution to likely get that local foreign limit up to meet your contract needs. And, and just my note on that would be make sure you do that with plenty of time because the other jurisdictions can be quite slow in yes. the U.S. Right. Um, <laughs> I, I wish that we lived in some of those countries because, yes, uh, the, it, it can take days, if not weeks, you know, just to kind of get. Months. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Hong Kong especially can take months. Yeah, yeah. Oh, right, especially, right. especially non-English speaking, it's, yeah. it's even harder because you deal with the translation, the time zones, everything. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Um, let's get into some, some detail of just a certificate of insurance. Is, is everybody familiar with what a certificate of insurance is? Do you know how to read it? Are you sure? Okay. You want to do a quick, just a quick run through the cert and not necessarily get into all the details? Sure. Uh, so there's a handout here, but uh, 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 essentially, Easier. I highlighted some key paragraphs, and I don't want to, I don't want to read them line by line, but they are essentially telling you what we've been representing the whole time, that this is really just a piece of paper showing that an insurance policy exists. It's on, yeah, I think page 17 of the handout. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't grant you any sort of privileges or anything like that. All these highlighted things say it's all subject to the policy terms and conditions. This does not grant you anything. So if you're renting a, a boat or whatever from a vendor and they hand you this, but you don't have it on the contract, you're not covered. So contract is key there. This just supports, you know, is kind of sleep at night coverage. Once you have the contract in place, this is, you know, adding that support there. Um, and sometimes your contract is your invoice if you're dealing with a vendor. Yeah, you know, they can put the terms it, and conditions it, within it, it the, the invoice itself. It can be in that itself. invoice. You know, it doesn't have to be a big, long, fancy schmancy con contract. It can be an invoice. Yeah. You know, Depends as long on as the company's policy. Yes, that's also true. Um, some, some of the, one thing I just want to talk about is that oftentimes we'll get feedback saying, hey, we have a vendor that's wanting $5 million and I'm looking at your certificate and all I see here is on general liability, it shows, you know, $1 million limit. Do I have enough coverage? Uh, there, so it, you, you see here kind of in the middle, there's general liability, there's auto liability, then it goes to umbrella excess liability here. That umbrella or excess liability policy is effectively raising up the total limits of liability. Um, so if you have a 1 million GL and say your excess here in this example shows 9 million, you have a total of $10 million of liability coverage. So if the vendor is asking you for 5 or 10, you're meeting that requirement. So just don't get lost in the fact that just because you see general liability for 1 million, you have more coverage here, assuming that, again, that umbrella or excess liability box is checked off and it shows limit there. And that's always good, you know, to, to submit those requirements, but also that's why you want to submit the cert or that somebody's giving you to make sure that it's what you've been asked for. If, if you're not looking at it or if you're not sure whether or not it's supposed to be, get it to your insurance person, get it 
to the people that are dealing with that, they can look at it and say, yeah, that works, or no, that doesn't work, or yeah. and this is why, um, and vice versa. There, you're going to have vendors, companies who are asking you for insurance. They're going to give you their requirements, and you want to talk to your insurance people about what you want to represent on that certificate, because you may not want to represent that you have 20 million insurance standard. If they're asking for five, you give them five. You don't have to give them 20. You just want to make sure that you're meeting those requirements. Yeah, and that, that's a great point. Because um, that's something that we would, as a broker, would recommend doing as well. Uh, just because because you could agree to five in the contract, but if they see 20 on the cert, then it opens up a gray area for you know, counsel or lawyer to get into the weeds and say, well, now I see 20 and I know what you really have. I'm going to go after that from a from a claim standpoint. So show what you show what you're required to have or what you've negotiated in the contract. Um, yeah. But. OK, let's uh, let's dive in through. There's um, we went through additional insured. Primary non-contributory. Um, there's a little handy checklist. Uh, it's page 35 where it's the middle of the smaller handout. It's a special coverage checklist and this is a good sort of thing to kind of run through. Um, different insurance companies have variations of this, okay, so so that this is not just something from Aana. You'll, you'll run into this with some of the other insurance companies as well, which just kind of helps you go through to know when you're looking at your script or you're looking at your project what you're going to have to get because it's got things like aircraft or drones which is a whole new area that has to be dealt with um, you know you're talking about animals you're talking about pyrotechnics you're talking about watercraft railroad stunts all of these different kinds of things and when you look at your project you're going to be able to look at that and say okay yeah we are going to do aerials okay how are we going to do aerials are we hiring a helicopter or are we doing a drone different requirements um, different things that you need to pay attention to. Are you hiring boats? Boats have turned into a huge, huge thing because you used to be able to take watercraft that were, and, it, and again, it depends on the insurance company, but boats used to be that if it was under a certain size, fees, you wouldn't necessarily have to pay for fees that much or, or depending on what you're using it. That's pretty much gone away so that you have to pay something and this is for your own insurance this is not the owner's insurance this is not whoever has that boat this is your protection um, and so the watercraft watercraft and aircraft tend to be their completely own entities as far as insurance goes and what re what's required and what isn't required and in our handy dandy little the smaller hand out here, I put some pictures. And they're pictures of boats. Look at the last one. It, it's, it's, in the, it's the last page of the, water, of the smaller hand, handout. It's not in the bigger handout. It's just in the smaller handout. It's a bamboo raft built literally with bamboo and rope. That's a boat. Yeah. That has to be insured. Your insurance is probably going to cost more than that boat is. So then you're going to start looking at and talking to your insurer about what are the risks. Where are you? Are you on a, a closed river, closed lake? Is anybody else around? Are you on a area of water way that has traffic going back and forth? Are you people the only ones that are going to be there? Are other people going to be there? Who could get hurt? You're really looking at a whole different set of risk there. And then it's the decision between your company and your insurers what you're doing. Are you actually going to insure that boat? You're insuring the boat for liability. You're not necessarily insuring it for damage to the boat itself. You're going back to that third party liability. Who else can get injured? How is this going to happen? 
if you make the choice that you're not going to ensure that watercraft, whether it is a bamboo raft or a canoe or a zodiac or a jet ski or a hovercraft that can literally fly above the water, you're then putting your company into accepting the risk for that and the insurance isn't going to respond if something happens. So you just need to know that, that watercraft is a whole different world than helicopters or planes or drones or any of those kind of things and has a lot of separate issues that you need to look at um, when you're doing that. And when you're going out and hiring private yachts, boats, speedboats, rowboats, anything like that, and somebody says, oh yeah, I have insurance, you need to look at the insurance to find out whether or not it will respond to what you are doing. Because most owner insurance policies are written to protect them as pleasure craft. And the minute you start doing something that you're paying them for, it falls into a whole different area and their insurance may not respond. So you may think that you've got coverage and you don't. So those are the questions that you have to start asking is, what is their insurance? Will it cover what we're doing? Who's operating the boat? <laughs> are we doing it? Are they doing it? And uh, there's a few more that are escaping me at the moment, but it's it's basically checking to see whether or not their insurance is going to actually respond to what you're doing if you're hiring their boats. If you're just hiring the boat and you're going to staff it yourself and you guys are going to run it, that's a, then that's a whole different area. So watercraft is, a, is an area that you really need to look at as far as that goes. And we're talking liability for the most part of what happens if you hurt somebody else. You run into somebody else. You run into a dock. You run into another boat. You run into a pylon in the water, all that sort of thing. I just had a quick question um, looking at this checklist, which is great. The railroad locations one, is that a recent addition due to um, Midnight Rider that's the, gone in there? The foreign location? The um, railroad oh, locations, railroad? number 10. Yeah. Yeah. Not a, recent, not a recent addition, but certainly one that we want to address. So I just... Anything on here is, is potentially like an added cost beyond the standard insurance that you would already have taken out. So if you have something like this, it's, it's again, it's just a trigger to have a bit of dialogue. And I think maybe to your point is that from a railroad perspective, um, railroad, just like watercraft, it, it, can, it floats and it, sometimes it might be something that can go to a, gen, a general liability policy. And depending upon the scenario, it may be where you have to take out a separate railroad protective policy mm -hmm. because the railroads still hold on to the, the mindset of the 1800s where they were the king of transportation. And they are still, to this day, can have it where you are responsible for taking out a policy under their name and paying for it that's protecting solely them. You still need to cover the, your railroad interest under your general liability policy. So. I don't, I don't want to belabor the point too much, but yeah, that's why that railroad's here because it, it floats into two different spectrums of insurance and it just allows us to have dialogue with you to say, well, what, what's going on and is there really a need to have a now separate railroad policy or can we address it under your general liability policy? Um, just one more point, under a standard general liability policy, railroad has an, ex, has an exclusion, exclusion on it that we have to work towards if you're working within like 50 feet of a railroad. That could even be if you're standing on the platform and it just so happens to be within 50 feet, that's excluded under standard liability coverage and you need to work through it with your insurance broker. And all of these things, when you look at this che checklist, these are all the things that your legal and insurance needs to be advised about. This kind of gives you that, that thing of as you're going through your creative, even right from the beginning of, oh yeah, we've got all of this or we've got these different things that we're dealing with, that starts giving you the questions of what you should be asking about to your legal and to your, your insurance people so that they can start, right again, right from the beginning and tell you where you are, which also is going to help your budget because they're going to know about it now and can tell you what that cost is 
rather than coming back later and saying, oh, I forgot to tell you that this is what we have and this is what we're doing and oh yeah, we just hired this million dollar yacht and we don't have insurance. So, or do we have insurance? Or how do we do this? Um, that gives you that starting point of these are the things that you need to be talking to them about. Yeah, we, we try to draw that out in some of the questions too. So, you know, it's, it's kind of helped to be as a guide, a conversation facil you know, facilitator as well. So. There's in this, the smaller handout, and I think, and it's also in the bigger handout, is the aircraft questionnaire. This is something that most insurance companies are going to, in one way, shape, or form, are going to ask you to fill out. Um, sometimes your studio is going to ask you to fill that out. They may have their own version of this. All that information goes into what your insurance is going to be and what you're doing and what you're no going to need somebody else to cover. So they're going to look at that and you need all of that information. That also is helping you with due dil your due diligence so that you're looking at all of their documents and saying, okay, I've got their registration number, I've got their uh, licenses, I've got their maintenance records. This is all going to help insurers as well as you do your due, uh, due diligence. And Toby, I'll let you go through just what some of this stuff is. Oh, um, yeah, I mean, they're, 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 common, they're common questions. I think the one heart that I would want to talk about with aircraft is, and it goes to watercraft too, is if you're hiring a, a, somebody that's providing a service to you, you want them to have some kind of limits to bring to the table, right? If they're piloting your aircraft, if they're, you know, captaining the boat that's driving your production crew around or to driving as a, as a you know, a, a hero vehicle or hero watercraft or whatever, you want them to have insurance for their own actions. And then what we would end up doing is putting a non-dome policy in place that covers the, per, you know, your interest as a production for any sort of direction or control that you might have. So. Right. You're not you're not the experienced pilot. You're not the one who's telling them how to, you know what altitude to go to and all that kind of stuff. But you could be saying, you know what? I think it'd be a really great shot if I want I want you to get up, go over here. I want you to move the boat over here. And as a result of that, they they crash and there's a claim that comes back. That can be production's responsibility, and that's the reason for having these types of questions here. And it's also why in these questions that you'll see for aircraft and watercraft, we ask that the aircraft owner or the watercraft owner, whomever it is, provides you with a certificate of insurance, you know, that you have a contract with them where they're indemnifying you, that they're extending their own insurance for their own actions. So it's that mutual exchange of indemnities, right? You're, you're saying, I'm, I'll cover my interest, you cover yours, and when a claim happens, it, it'll get sorted out right through the details of the particular scenario. But that way, you're covering all possible scenarios and in that situation. So one question, um, the difference between chartering a boat or a helicopter and walking up and buying a ticket, yeah. what happens? What's the difference as far as insurance and, and those sorts of things goes? If you're just walking up and buying a ticket, the typical philosophy is that the insurance is not your responsibility, you being the production, right? That's American Airlines, that's Ferry Boat Incorporated, whatever it's going to be, and they have the insurance because they're in control of the entire process from start to finish, right? If you are specifically chartering it and or staffing it with your production crew or hiring on that captain to, you know, drive the boat, pilot the plane, whatever, You've now assumed that responsibility, and then it becomes something that you need to have insured under your own policy. And if, especially if you're in control of the whatever craft it's going to be, that's your primary responsibility. Your policy is going to be dollar, you know, policy number one in that scenario. So it, it, it makes a difference. And I would even further go to argue that if you're chartering a plane, if you are chartering it through the, your own production corporation, you're paying it, you know, through whatever production company LLC's credit card. 
that is something where I would still recommend doing a non-own aircraft policy because um, if there were to be an injury and you know the talent crew, whoever were to be, they can come back and say, well, if it weren't for the fact that you're the one that chose that chartering company, you, you're the one that vetted and said that this is going to be a great, great company and now it's, it's, cr it's crashed because of it and now we're hurt or their family's coming at you, we're hurt because you specifically chose that plane. That's a scenario to think about as well. But the, hey, I'm just buying a ticket from American Airlines. You shouldn't have a need to buy separate insurance for that. And that also goes to when you're doing um, location scouts and you're going to go up and you find some little helicopter company that you're just going to go up and buy a ticket and go up and look around. That falls into that same kind of a thing. But if you go and say, okay, I'm going to hire this company and it's only going to take our people, that's a gray area because you're technically just going up and buying tickets for your people. If someone else could, uh, my understanding is if somebody else could still come up and buy a ticket and get on that aircraft with you, you're fine. But if you're going to come in and say, I want you exclusively for us for this period of time, you really need to talk to your people about whether or not you should have a policy in place. Yeah, that's a great point of clarification. That exclusive, exclusivity, however you say that word, that is, that's the trigger for whether it really becomes a responsibility for you to need to think about taking out your own insurance. You mentioned when you charter a plane, you uh, look at the inspectors. Um, which I do as well. However, once I get those, it looks like German to me. Who we get them to? translated. Do you have someone that you send them to? to well, we, we have people who know how to look at that, but we also send them to our insurance people who have their aircraft people who look at those things, um, which is why you have to do things with enough time so that you can do that and have them look at that. Um, the other thing that we require is insurance documents in English. And if they're not in English and we can't get the translations from that com country or that facilitator, we send them to a translator and we have them translated so that we know what it is and we submit those English documents to our insurance people so they can look at it. When we're in some foreign countries, you know, if, if we're pressed for time, we will have our foreign brokers talk to their partners in that country, and they will send those documents to them and have them look at them to see that they're okay. So you, you have to do things within time, and, and going to what we said before, insurance in foreign countries takes forever. If you think you have a long time in the United States, it takes forever to get things done and you just have to really stay on it and 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 give yourself enough time to deal with it but i also just say if you're not sure send it to an expert to get them to and there's lots of aviation experts out there who can have a look at it and even just get on the phone and expert to pilot talk or expert to mechanic if you just not if it doesn't smell right just check it yeah or hire another company <laughs> So, Stephanie, you and Electus did different policies depending on the show, but you also have one blanket one I'm assuming for the year. Like, how does that going to do that? Yeah, um, we do take out specific policies for certain, for our shows. So, for example, uh, one of our shows that is going to be premiering next week on Discovery had very specific risks to it, so we have a policy written just for that. But we do have, for example, a general liability policy that covers all of our shows. We don't have to take that out on an incident basis. Um, that's kind of one of the advantages of being a larger production company as well as having being tied to a larger company. Um, if you're a smaller production company or an indie company, uh, you may not actually want to incur the cost of having a GL policy or an ENO policy that's that broad that it lasts for at least a year and it has you know as many shows or films as you can make because that's a higher premium. Um, so there is that cost benefit. But again, for us, we'll, we'll have those policies that are just sort of there 
and we don't have to really think about it. It's more of going into each particular show and what are their exact risks and, you know, do we need to add a watercraft policy? Do we need to add an unmanned area, aerial policy? So, do you, so you have the basic GL and then on certain shows you just have it flow in terms of this one is as aircraft. So you're going to add that to your policy for that time being or do you get you do get a whole policy? <laughs> You know what I mean? It, it kind of depends on the situation. I mean, as soon as we start a new show, we're going to make sure we have our basic production insurance in place for that show. And as we do that, um, because that, that the basic production insurance is more than just your general liability and, you know, and things like that. So as we're getting that in place, that's when we'll address, do we need uh, aircraft or watercraft. And that's also something that might get tacked on later because creative changes. So, uh, and I think this was kind of Mary Pat's point. Sometimes we don't know when we're starting that we're going to use a watercraft, or maybe somebody hasn't told us yet that they would really like to film something with a drone. These are nice little surprises that can pop up, you know, halfway through the production. And then it's going back to our insurance carrier and saying, Hey, this is what we now need. What does it cost to add this policy to our existing? For X amount of days though. It would have to be more than just X amount of days because it's got to cover, uh, usually like the entire time you're filming and what you get out of it. It's, you know, it's one of those things where damages can be, it can occur even later. So like somebody may not realize you kind of nicked the the dock until they see the show, and then when they see it, you you're now getting a claim. Then, so there is a bit of a tail. Just re just really quickly, I would add that if you do know, if you have some kind of forethought into or insight as to what's going to be happening throughout the year, some of these policies can be structured on an annual basis. You can go and say, "I'm going to have five anticipated aerial days." Get a policy that's going to cover that. It doesn't alleviate the obligation to actually go and say. Okay, I'm going to be filming today. I'll be filming on you know March 1st or whatever. You still have to kind of report it as it comes up, but from a cost advent advantageous standpoint, you can parlay that and just get it on a lower cost basis to have one annual policy that's going to right structure against how many aerial days you're anticipating, right? And you can adjust it throughout throughout the year, throughout each renewal or whatever it's going to be. So. You hear the question? Yeah. So on the topic of surprises, like. If you guys get called me at night from the producers, let's say a boat that, that the producers vetted and got insurance on and super, everything, all the dashes were up, but we get out of the field and the boat doesn't start for some reason. Then when he's got a, he's got a backup boat, then you got the whole crew and cast weight, but, but no questionnaire got on that boat. Well, does that hold up production the next amount of days, or what advice are you giving the producers? Yeah, I mean, it can if you have that kind of, well, yeah, so what we work towards is obviously to be available, right, it, wherever humanly possible, right? So, you know, my cell phone's there, so I get calls after hours, so that, that's the expectation. We know the scope of work and the time frames that you work towards, and we try to work as best as possible to, to meet those expectations and to get something covered. Um, in that particular scenario, if you were to have a change in boat, uh, it depends on how your policy was structured. Uh, it, it could very well likely trigger an obligation to have to report the new parameters of the boat because you could have been changing from a fishing boat to a yacht, and that's going to be a he totally different thing, right? Um, but if it was just like for like, you know, depending again how the, your insurance policy is structured, it are, may, there may not need to be an, a, a, a switcheroo, a new questionnaire. You, you just really have to have that conversation with your insurance broker to, to know for sure. I would say I would say also to that because I deal with that. Often you're sort of laying that out ahead of time of this is what we've got, this is what's happening. We you know, if something happens, what can we do? Sometimes as Toby said, depending on how your insurance policy is structured, they may accept a questionnaire after the fact, particularly if it's late at night or on a weekend or something like that where you can't turn it around. As long as you you get it and you turn it around and you've informed them um, of what you're doing to begin with, usually you can find a way to, to deal with that and, and come up with the stuff after the fact. And after the fact means within like 24 or 48 hours at the most. Um, but again, that's a conversation that you need to be having with your brokers or your insurance rep in advance. 
Let's talk about drones. Oh, there are, there are sorry. Questions. Um, well, I actually, uh, I listened to it yesterday. Um, I'm doing a, a film right now where the scene with a gun, um, fires off screen, so we established early on. Um, we're going to go from non operational gun firing cover off guns to get a um, you know, cheaper policy. Uh, and yesterday, we got to see a fire on screen. So, you know, I told my broker, and he's like, well, that's going to be the big issue for a and luckily I talked her at the end because we're keeping it off camera, but I'm curious in like more details on how something like that, um, you know, how the workers come played in the stunts and, and as with their activities and um, the situation where like that would affect my entire he's like, you have to cancel your policy, we do all of it. Um, have any Well, it, de it depends on, I don't know if you're buying short, if you're buying like short term, okay, if you're buying short term specific insurance, and certainly that advice is sound advice, because that policy is just very template and you need to make each and every change aware, right? If you're working more of a broader scope with a network or a studio, or even if you're taking out your own annualized policy, like my goal as a broker would be to structure it in a way that it doesn't alleviate you from having to have that discussion to say, I'm changing from on off camera to on camera using a fake prop to a real gun or whatever it's going to be. Um, but it would be something where we wouldn't have to go and get into a lot of the paperwork, the admin kind of components of it. It would just be more of having a discussion with the insurance company, getting them to sign off, and me coming back to you saying we're, we're good, right, an email or whatever it's going to be. So short-term insurance, yeah, you're certainly beholden to a lot more of the, the nuances that you, you're talking about. Back there. Depends on the country and depends on what you're asking them for, but it can, as Julian also attested, it can take months. So if you know ahead of time that you're doing something in, in a foreign country, you want to start that ball immediately. Um, you can certainly, if you've, if you've got good people working with you, they can certainly pressure as best they can um, to get the insurers to work a little faster, but no offense, Toby, but insurers take a long time. It doesn't matter where you are. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not. I'm not one, so I don't take offense at all. I, again, I broker it, so certainly the insurance companies. Yeah, they, the broker. You know, we, we're there to talk after hours. The insurance companies are pretty regimented in that kind of thing. So that's why, again, my goal as a broker is to structure your policy as broadly as possible. So that it, you know, it'll take on some of these, you know, different scenarios that you're talking about, so that we can hopefully just have a conversation to say, you know what, you're good. Thanks for letting me know, and you know, Godspeed or whatever it's going to be, All right? But when you have these checklist items come up, those are going to be ones that are going to take time, especially when you're dealing outside the U.S. I guess, confidently, I guess I probably less than ten. So it's a very niche, very niche market. And I say ten. I just use that as a placeholder. I mean, because different companies play in different areas. Some might just like the liability. Some might just like the e the errors and emissions. Some might just like the production package, which is just the policy where you're covering your cast if they get sick or injured, and now you're you can't film today because your talent's not there, right? So diff there are different markets that like certain niches within entertainment of itself, but about, about 10. Is there enough that it's competitive, or is it at one point someone told me they were only two insurance companies, correct? Still doing major, the bulk of the work. Right, so there's there's certainly like two or three big leading ones that, that, that do it, um, but it surprisingly, it's 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 a competitive market right now, to, to, to like the broker surprise, because we've had some pretty big industry cast claims, which you probably all read about, and that affects all of you, even if it's not your your deal, because these have actually been the the, the big the biggest claims that have been paid out historically to date, just because budgets are rising, right? So as the budget rises, the claims get bigger and bigger. So that affects you though, because it's all like I said, all interrelated, all like a 
while you have insurance behind the scenes, there are reinsurers that are, you know, the insurance companies take on maybe 20%, 30% of the limit that they're showing to you and they reinsure everything else, but it's all interconnected. So again, yes, it's 10. Surprisingly though, it's still very competitive despite where we are with, you know, industry claims and having a limited number of markets. Um, those who are in it like the business and overall, it's still profitable industry-wide, so it, it, it still drives competition. Let's jump into drones real quick, because um, we're, we're getting, we really are getting down to the end of this. Um, drones have their own fun, different requirements, and drones in the United States are different than drones anywhere else in the world. So drones are aircraft. They fall under some of the same requirements with aircraft. Um, I know from experience that my network will not insure a drone. And they require that the drone operator or the drone owner, if it's a owner operator, has liability insurance, just like you would for an air, any, any other aircraft. Their limits might be different, but um, not usually. Usually they're asking for similar similar kinds of limits. Um, that goes to that care, custody, and control um, language that, that dictates a lot of what happens with insurance as well. Um, but the drone operator and the drone owner, they're in control of that drone. So whatever happens... It, you want to make sure that it's under their insurance. Um, as far as licensing, there's government requirements in the United States. There are requirements in other countries that are different than what we require. Some countries have no requirements at all. It's, it's Wild West. Um, they don't have any issues at all. Some countries say you can fly a drone in certain areas, but you can't fly it over the city where you can't fly it over city buildings, or you can't fly it over any kind of government buildings. Um, so if you're using a drone anywhere, you need to find out what the local issues are and what they require and what their licensing is required and what they won't allow you to do. And um, I know for us, my legal um, requires the same kind of due diligence as we would for a helicopter. We want to know that there's licensing and if they're licensed, what the license is and where it comes from and who issued it and, and is there equipment being mounted to the drone and who's insuring the equipment and all of those things. So drones, drones are still kind of a little bit um, wild west, as they said. There's also some other uh, jurisdictional requirements, like if you're flying a drone in Korea, you're going to need uh, military intelligence uh, permission, but also they will have the right of review of your content um, in that space. And then in the European Union, um, there's privacy laws as well, um, mm -hmm. which, which fall into place. So once you've done all these other elements, there's local jurisdictional things which you'll need to make sure you've got in place. Yeah, so, so that's something, I mean, as much as everybody loves the idea of using a drone, um, you get great stuff. It, it also costs a hell of a lot cheaper than hiring a helicopter to do aerials. But that doesn't mean that you're absolved of doing all of the things that you need to do otherwise. Those things are still in play. Um, and you, you want to make sure that, that you're covered. Um, we killed the drone. <laughs> We killed a drone in, in Africa, um, and we're very grateful that we had somebody who was very good at it. They miscalculated uh, an angle, and they crashed that drone. And we had no responsibility because it was their insurance, it was their property, they covered everything, and luckily they didn't hurt anybody. They crashed it into the side of a mountain. Um, but those are the things that happen, and that's what you want to make sure. And unfortunately, that footage was not salvageable, which is really a bummer. Um, but we were able to get some of the footage from some, uh, some other cameras that were up there. But that's, that's also the other thing that happens when you have a drone is it crashes. You may not get that footage. 
So it's it's a toss up, um, but it certainly is from a budget standpoint. It certainly is is something. Um, but again, you've got your you've got an unmanned aerial system questionnaire there. Um, that's pretty standard at this point for most insurance companies, whether it's Aon or, or any of them. They're going to be asking for this kind of information. And again, it's going to go to the contract. What does your contract say? You know, what does your contract allow? Um, who's responsible for what? Um, because it really is one of those things where it, it's flying and you're not the pilot. So um, the other question that kind of has to be sorted out with regard to drone is you may have cameramen who come in that you've hired as an employee who wants to come in and use their drone and you really need to talk to your insurance people about that because then that does become your liability they're an employee they're not a vendor um, and it's very difficult challenging to separate when somebody is an employee and somebody is functioning as a vendor so you may want to look at whether or not that's a smart thing to do um, because again how do you differentiate between the guy who's the cameraman and doing cameraman duties and the guy who's the drone vendor and doing drone footage and where does his insurance fall and where does your insurance fall and who's liable for what if something happens. Um, so those are different questions that are starting to come up now when you're thinking about using a drone. Um, and I'll throw that. Yes. Uh, you know, whether it's actually being used as a photograph versus being used as a prop within a scene, mm -hmm. how that mm -hmm. works. Uh, the other thing is when you do some of the, not necessarily in the U.S., but even in the U.S., do you get around some of the, you know, establishing shots where you're not actually dealing with talent by getting a company that goes out and photographs with the drone and then you're licensing the footage as opposed to you actually we don't, but but, obviously a lot of people, but people do. do. I mean, you yeah. See the stuff on YouTube yeah. that people have obviously gone out, and shot a lot of stuff, you know, beauty shots, things like that, that are obviously not within the licensing requirements or even the FAA requirements that are necessary. I think that's a that falls to kind of legal and. Well, I'll I'll jump in on this one. Um, if you are like at least from. My, the companies I've worked for, our policy has been very clear. If they're not a FAA licensed company, if they haven't followed all the rules, you cannot license that footage because, and some of this is the difference between being on YouTube and being on a national broadcaster, whether it's CBS, NBC, Discovery Channel, A&E. Um, now people are looking. They're not necessarily scouring YouTube to see if somebody has a photo of their property. But if you're using it as an establishment shot, you know, just take like some scenery in Hawaii, all of a sudden now you've got people in, who are going, wait a second, do we? he's complied with them. There are other places like say Mongolia where they really don't have any laws. But And once you know that, it's a very different analysis. So it's going to depend on where it is, who's done it, and what capacity are you using it. And some countries do require a permit yeah. to be able to use it and film. And so then that falls into, you know, do you have a permit for and what you just shot? And there's also differencing the permits for personal use and commercial use. And, you know, no matter how hard we try, uh, television and film is always considered commercial. It's not personal. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I would just add to that that permit doesn't necessarily mean that you have the right to exploit that, that footage, right? So just because you have the permit to go film in downtown LA doesn't mean that you have the right to show the Staples Center or that artist mural in the background that just happened to be painting, you know, painted on 7th and Figueroa or whatever it is, right? So that still needs to go through due diligence with, you know, your legal rep. And that, that's a second layer of review, which I would call the pre-publication review. So that's a little bit separate. It does involve risk, but again, if we're looking just simply from an insurance standpoint, and can can I just grab something off the internet or can I just have a guy come in and do it and then license it from him? I would say the rule of thumb is no. And I'll just add real quick to that, from the indie perspective, you 
we end up having a lot of stock footage, right? Because you just don't have it in the budget to have a drone or to have uh, any of these things. So you have to get it from a third party. Um, and I feel like it's one of those things that oftentimes that the producers won't tell me about because they're like, it's simple. It's just I'm just grabbing stock footage from this website or whatever. And I just strongly urge you, as soon as you're even thinking about it, right, that you send it over to your legal team so that they can took one, take a look at what that website is saying, you know, in terms of what you're agreeing to, but also that they can ask some of these questions and see if it's really worth the risk. Because I also find then once fast forward to delivery to, you know, to a studio or a network, I find the things that get hung up the most are music and stack footage. And, and the reason for that is because we didn't go, that the producers didn't go through this kind of due diligence with the stack footage. And oftentimes that means that we're going to be changing up the cut. Um, and getting rid of some of this footage. So just just be aware um, from the, the beginning that uh, stock footage is not something that you should just um, take lightly. And, and just to that point, I know sometimes it's easy to look at some of the fees that you're charged to use, we'll call them more reputable sources for stock footage, and it feels like this initial hit to your budget that just really, really hurts. Um, when you have to unlock a cut to pull something out and put something else in, there's an expense with that. If you get sued, there's an expense with that. So it, I understand and I feel for, for those initial hits to the production budget, but those actually can be less than if it's a situation like Kate said where you find out later, oh, no, we really can't use this. And now you've got to get editors back in and you've got to go get a story producer in to find it. These are all costs that you didn't budget for that likely will end up being more than if you had just gone through a source that gave you everything you needed up front. Yeah, because and, and the cost for that can even be higher because often in that situation, nobody... It, it chances it wasn't disclosed, so you know we didn't know to flag this for you guys and to have it swapped out before it delivered. So it's likely a situation. I'm just going to use television because that's more my my background. You know, the episode has aired. The uh, the person, the the government entity, or the individual who feels that you didn't have the right to be there now is aware of it. You're getting a cease and desist letter. Not only do I have to pull that out of rotation, get it out of the cut, put something new in, I may have an entire piece of uh, property that I can't exploit until we have this whole situation resolved. And so that, again, is additional costs. Not to mention now, what about the relationship between the production company and the network? You know, how, what, what's that trust going to look like? So it's, there, there are larger pieces at play that Again, can be I think frustrating sometimes on the production end because you know for your, for a lot of producers you know you're you're involved with this show and then you're gone and you're on to the next one. For people like Kate and for me, I'm on this you know years later and I and it's my relationship with that network and it's my 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 client's brand that could potentially be tarnished and my client who's going to be holding the bag for whatever the infringement claim is. So it. It's great when you have that creative idea, but it goes back to what I would say is the big take theme of this uh, entire conference, which is talk to us. If there's something you want, if you tell me you want a drone, we can talk about how we can get that in place in advance so you get what you want. It just may cost you. And that then, you know, it's figuring out what, what do you care more about? Do, do you want to buy lots of really fancy boots to take into this location or do you want to use a drone in this allocation of resources? Yeah, right. um, it, it ultimately I will look at the license. Um, so some of the things that we'll look for, you rep and warrant that you own the materials that you're giving us. Um, you will indemnify us for the use. Probably one of the most important ones, you're waiving injunctive relief. If they won't do that, don't be surprised when they say, no, you can't use it. I mean, there are other places. And again, Getty is a good example because they have a very robust release. They'll negotiate. And you, you're paying, but you, you are getting something. And they'll even tell you, oh, there are third parties in here that aren't released. You would need to get additional clearances. Then you might take another place that, um, you know, my, one of my examples that when I see, I, I just cringe, Pond 5. They, if you pull their, you know, release, it says, okay, well, we 
told people to put stuff on here and we're fine with you using it, but not telling you you have the right to, not telling you you won't get sued. And by the way, we're not waiving injunctive relief. Like every big red flag I can possibly find has popped out now. And, it's, and when the production comes to me and says, well, but it's really cheap. It's like, not really. Because when you start factoring in all these other costs, that's very expensive. So it's, but to your, I think to the point of your question, when you find a site that you're like, oh my gosh, this has an image I'm really interested in, step one, find out what the release is. They'll give you a draft or you can download it. And it's bringing that to your business affairs or your legal affairs to say, hey, can you review this? Does this work? And again, my first response, if it's not there, is let's put it in and let's go back and let's see if they'll agree to it. Mm. Some places negotiate, some places don't. Okay, we need to wrap up. We're a little bit past our time. If you've got specific questions, we've got some time in the room still that you can come back and ask. I know, Victor, you've got a question. Um, but we do need to wrap up. So let me thank Toby Cup and Stephanie Ward and Kate Imp and Julian Women. I hope, I hope you have questions that have been answered and have questions to take back to your people and ask about. Um, just so that you have the information, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>